Hello my fellow Alaskans and good evening. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful one. I am so glad that you could join us here this evening. We are currently about ready to begin the House Budget and Senate debate for HB 281, 282 and all of the things that they have done to change the bill to match the agenda that they have in play down there in Juneau. Um, but they have other things going on. The Senate is currently at ease. The House is discussing other bills. I do have another clip that I'm going to show here from the House so that you guys got a little bit of a inkling on what they are planning or what they are currently working on down there in Juneau and what they are the, the, the game plan is. Um, but they had to waive uniform rules to be able to hear the budget early because today is the very last day and they have to have it all done. Um, one of the things we're also going to listen to is HB 114, the Reads Act. It's in the House right now and I would love for you guys all to hear the reasons they're giving not to concur this bill right now. Uh, the special interests are clearly at play. You can hear that with the testimony that is being given. Many of these people were at the uh, read uh, science of reading symposium that was here just a couple of weeks ago and uh, it's it's basically their their lockstep with NEA and the Alaska School District on the equities and diversity uh, pledge that they have made and this read act reads act goes against what they are trying to instill in their teachings down there in Juneau but for the moment, we are going to right now hop over and to look at what is going on for the uh, um, opening statements there in the House and the vote that occurred from that. And then we'll get right into HB, or excuse me, SB 114, the Reads Act, and what they're saying there. And sooner or later, they'll actually get to the actual budgets today. So here we go. And uh, away we go. Before we get started, I'm going to give you some information. This is the same information that was given to the Senate. And they have, um, at this time, on the last day of the second regular session, as provided in Article 2, Section 8 of the Alaska Constitution, it is my ruling as the speaker that the 24-hour rule in Uniform Rule 42C does not preclude consideration by the House of House Bill 281 or 282. The 24-hour rule in Uniform Rule 42C for Appropriations Bill has historically and routinely been waived by both the Senate and the House including but not limited to 1992, 1993, 1994, 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, and most recently in 2016. This precedent has allowed appropriations bills to be considered by both bodies on either on the same day or after being on, laid on members' desks overnight for less than a full 24 hours. Under the current circumstances, after weighing the long-standing interpretation and waiver of strict compliance with Uniform Rule 42C, recognized under Mason's Section 39 against the legislature's constitutional duty to pass a budget that provides for Alaskans, it is my ruling that House Bill 281 and 282 that has been available to members overnight can be taken up by the House today. Okay. There has been an objection. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, your citing of, of past times that the House has waived the rule is, is illustrative and educative, and that is exactly why, if we were to proceed in the manner that you direct, we should take the vote to waive the rule. It, it is not okay to simply assume that we're going to take the vote to weigh the rule. We should go through the process, and if the votes are there, the votes are there. Happy to do so.
man, nothing like finding out that you clicked the wrong button and you're just talking to yourself. So you saw the final vote there, and uh, the Alaska legislators made it very clear where they stood at and what they were planning on doing. Um, waiving the rule, only two voted against it, Kirka and Eastman, should have been all 40 of them there. We're going to hurry up and hop over to uh, listening to SB 114, which is the Reeds Act that is happening there in Juneau. And hopefully I've got everything up correctly on my screen here. Uh, it looks like I do. And let's see if we can get that one going. I want you to hear it all from the beginning. And then sooner or later, they're going to actually get to the HB 281 and 282 in both the House and the Senate. And I plan on live streaming whoever starts that first all the way through from start to finish and then I'll start either the House or the Senate whoever starts second I'll start their stream right after the Senate gets done with theirs so here we go and uh, hopefully I can find it here real quick and I uh, got audio output though where is that one everything changed on me there and uh, we should be able there we go all right, we got the right screen there clicked on this time. And let's get them actually rolling. This is SB 114, the Reeds Act. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the effective date clause. The clause has been adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into limbo file to take up House Bill 114. Hold on a second, folks. Okay. Somehow we lost all stream yeah, on that. Hopefully I can get back really to it again. Oops, I hit the wrong buttons here again. See if I can get it back to where it should be. It was addressed and they didn't include that here. Um, those are the main... Almost. Indications um, on cultural education start in this uh, um, and uh, all right. That's the best you're going to get. That's as close before. to the beginning so as it'll let me that, restart. Uh, it... Sorry, Sorry Madam Speaker, I highlighted the wrong part. Um, it addresses Head Start in this uh, um, bill because there was a number of concerns that the original version might have negatively impacted the Head Start programs uh, through this bill. Um, and it addresses to make sure that uh, it makes a new attempt at making sure that it does not uh, um, address the or does not impact the Head Start programs. Um, next change is uh, it creates a uh, annual task force that meets and makes recommendations um, on cultural education. Not any real changes to cultural education, but that uh, recommended it recommends to the board um, uh, of Alaska Education what those changes uh, could be to support culturally relevant education um, and, and um, something we have a lot of reports on it as well. Second, uh, fourth, sorry, um, it uh, adds an entirely new section into the bill that is um, supposedly a technical change but allows for language that is earlier in the Title 14 chapter saying a, the department may withhold funds from a school district if they do not uh, follow the general rules of the state of Alaska. That's been on the books for a long time. This now incorporates that language into the bill. Um, we have not had the opportunity as this far smarter body here to look into that and try to make sure that it is um, uh, actually what, what we're being, uh, what, if that, what that change makes. Um, and if it's going to apply specifically to this Reads Act or still as a broad uh, impact. Uh, it also includes, includes the uh, increase to a base student allocation of $30 per school district. Um, and uh, so it increases the base student allocation from 5930 to 5960 um, which is a, a small amount for the three quarters of the districts in the state. 
Uh, finally, one other change in the Alaska Reads Act is uh, including a pupil transportation um, language so that in the pre-K program of the bill, those students would now be included in the pupil transportation funding. That was a loophole that we discovered here in the Smarter Body and made sure it was addressed, and they did include that here. Um, those are the main uh, changes to the, this legislation here. I'm available for any questions uh, from the body if you guys have any, and thank you very much. Great fittings. We're independently not able to get the requisite support. Deals with. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll I'll try to be brief. Uh, even though this is a, a large collection of bills that we've assembled for this vote. The process that is written down that we are following today uh, deals with uh, a single subject rule on legislation. It deals with you know, a, a minimum number of members in the other body and, and in this body uh, having support for a bill. I see because of this, the way this is packed before us that each of these bills were independently not able to get the requisite support in the other body or in this body uh, or maybe even in both. And so they're, they're here before us now in a package to try and assemble together the number of votes. And, and there are times when the constituent asks me, well, why does the law say that? And, and I'm looking and I'm trying to figure it out, maybe do some of the history. And, and my best guess is that what was put into the law was not something that the majority of this body or the majority of that body ever supported. But because it was put into a package, um, it became law. And now somebody's got to go through the process of writing a bill to pull it back out again. Um, and, and that is just a terrible way to write policy. I understand members may be very interested in, in one or more of these packages. Um, from where I sit, each of the bills you know, sought to, to get support independently, uh, failed to do that, even if they might have been very good bills. And this is a terrible process. Thank you. Representative Kronk. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, for decades, this body has sent money to school districts. We've sent little or no policy to follow up with that money. This bill is an opportunity to say our kids are worth more than money. Um, they deserve good policy and accountability to go with the money you send them. Public education fund, pre-K ADM, a $30 BSA increase. That's good for kids. Um, the Department of Education just had a recent reading symposium, thousands of at least a thousand participants and great reviews. Um, they all recognize that we need to do better for reading. This is a great step forward. Pre K grants in this bill, good for kids. Um, this bill provides significant uh, districts with policy that will communicate with the legislature. Um, we need outcomes and improvement. Student or early learning, okay, I got early learning coordination, uh, parents as teachers. That's good for kids. Student and uh, school achievement, um, that money is good for kids. One time above BSA, that's good for kids. This bill is good for kids. The bottom line, we are here for kids. This is policy and accountability. This is a good bill. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Representative Rasmussen. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to highlight, in looking over the comparison sheet uh, of changes in this Bill, I see line one or item one through seven all include the exact same verbiage that says amend AS 14. Um, so I do feel like these are certainly related topics. Um, it may get a little messy at the end here just because of the legislative process. Unfortunately, um, our bodies allow for a single member to to block one piece of legislation that may share support of the majority of the member of or membership of both bodies. And so um, I will completely concur with the previous speaker that ultimately uh, we talk a lot about what's good for schools and we talk about the need education needs, but we don't often reference the kids. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate that all of the statute listed does reflect what's best for the kids, and I will be a yes vote on this. Thank you. Representative Ortiz. Oh, Ortiz. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. 
Um, I would not be supportive of, I'm not supportive of this particular bill. Um, the bill that was sent before us um, did not get, um, did not go through the committee process as was by mentioned um, by the member from District 10. Um, I never saw this bill before any committee that I, I sat on. Um, so what I am being asked to vote on is an omnibus bill of which I have not seen. Um, and what I am, the parts that I am aware of the bill, um, there are good parts. There are some parts that are good. Um, and it is a good thing to, you know, increase support for education. That's a good thing. Um, however, some of the requirements in the bill um, that we're putting on districts um, is an example of policy coming from legislators who are not educators. Um, I see examples where students can be screened for deficiencies at certain levels uh, in their reading ability, and when they don't measure up, uh, then the teacher, who may have 25 kids in their class, is expected to come up with what's the equivalent of an individual learning plan for each of those particular students that he or she may have that don't measure up. And I can guarantee you that being a former principal, being a former teacher, having a daughter who is a reading specialist, having a uh, wife who spent her whole life in education and has worked at the primary age level with reading instruction, I can guarantee you that taking the time to s write out an individual learning plan for each of these children who have not measured up on the screening, whatever screening utensil is being used to determine their not being at reading level, uh, reading grade level. Representative Ortiz. Yes, sorry. It's just you're using the teacher's time that it's not going to make a difference. It's just not going to make a difference in terms of uh, spending all that time with an ILP. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Edgman. Madam Speaker, I want to rise in opposition to this bill, not because I don't think it was well-intentioned or that it was a noble sort of in its, uh, its attempts to actually put together a, a major education bill. But first off, what's in the bill? You know, we've already heard that it hasn't gone through the committee process. We don't know exactly what, uh, what it does uh, per se because it's now knitted with a number of bills. But just very quickly before I hopefully yield to my colleague from Bethel, who knows, uh, who's more of a subject matter than I, um, here's what I don't like about this bill. Number one, it sidesteps the real issue. The real issue is, is teacher recruitment and retention. My superintendents tell me if we can get qualified teachers to come out and to stay and to get familiar with the communities, we can get our kids reading. We don't need another bill. So it's, it sidesteps the real problem, number one. Number two, the BSA in this thing is a joke. The BSA increase for members for Lucian's region is 6,781. The BSA increase for the Bristol Bay Borough is 8,777. This is on the heels of increased costs of fuel costs that have doubled. What are we going to, where are we going to be a couple of years ago, a couple of years from now, when we really need a significant BSA increase? And the body politic at that point goes, oh, no, 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 no. You already did a BSA increase a couple of years ago. Remember, it was $30, and we did a one time funding increase. This bill does not help rural Alaska. If you were to write a bill for big schools, I would write it just like this. So before I say th something I probably shouldn't say, Madam Speaker, I'd like to yield at some point to my colleague from Bethel. Thank you. Representative Merrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I encourage members of this body, especially those that sit on the House Finance Committee, to vote no on this piece of legislation for the sole reason it has a very large fiscal note that has not been vetted through our Finance Committee. I can't in good conscience vote for something without due diligence 
and I believe it is absolutely irresponsible. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Representative Fields. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that um, my colleague and the other body uh, did put a lot of hard work, but unfortunately, I'm not able to support it. Um, you know, as someone who represents an urban district um, in a district where people in my district are frankly willing to pay more taxes to support our schools, um, I, I could vote for a large fiscal note, but frankly, I have no confidence this particular fiscal note is going to do anything to improve our schools. I think, frankly, it's likely to hurt our schools. The $30 um, per student BSA can't possibly pay for the extensive mandates. These aren't unfunded mandates. They are grossly underfunded mandates. This bill significantly increases uh, the bureaucracy in the Department of Education and Early Development. Again, I could support that if I thought it was going to be useful, but sending out centralized bureaucrats to ride circuit in rural Alaska, do I have any confidence someone based in Anchorage hopping on a plane and flying out to Queethlock is going to do anything to improve the quality of education in Queethlock? No. Um, so we have a lot of costs. We have underfunded mandates. We have a lot of micromanagement of what teachers are trying to do. I've talked to teachers in my district and I asked them, I'm going to go down to Juneau, what do you want me to do? And they said, restore a meaningful pension. We have the worst um, retirement for teachers in America. Uh, my colleague from Dillingham is absolutely right. That's the core of the problem. The other thing they said is reduce class sizes. $30 per BSA, again, with this bill and with eight years of inflation adjusted cuts, once again, we're telling teachers to do more with less. And with this bill, we're giving the whole set of new bureaucracy and not enough money to pay for it. Um, I just can't support it. And I know the focus has been on how um, negative this can be for rural schools, but I've got serious concerns about urban schools as well. Thank you. Representative Wool. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to echo some of the comments that were previously made. Um, first and foremost, this bill never came to finance. I wanted it to, but it didn't get out of the Education Committee, where it sat for a long time and was amended 60 times. So I think some people in that committee had some concerns. I would have loved to see the bill and gone over it like we should have. Um, the BSA number was mentioned. It's uh, $30, and I believe that's a fiscal note of $6 million, although I haven't really seen the bill. I think that's $6 million. We have a BSA increase bill that was put forth by the member from Juneau. It was $72 million. So this is one-twelfth of that, one-twelfth. I don't know what good that's going to do. Um, I've talked to people in my district, education professionals, people in the administration of my school district, school board members and teachers, and not one of them recommended this bill. Not one of them. They all had issues. Some have been mentioned, statewide control. They want local control. They know their students. They know their districts. They know their stu uh, teachers. They know what works. And, and having someone statewide, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, flying around doesn't work. Speaking of flying around, I happened to be on a plane the other day, and a former employee of mine was sitting next to me. I, he was a long time ago employee, and he's done so much in his life. He was a teacher. He won Teacher of the Year. He won Coach of the Year. He's done so many things. He taught. He went up and got his PhD in math. I said, hey, what was your PhD in? What was your thesis on? He goes, I studied the correlation between teacher turnover in rural Alaska and standardized test scores. He said he could predict what the scores would be based on teacher turnover. Teacher turnover is the issue here. Getting good teachers to stick around is a major issue. He was from the Dillingham area uh, by birth. So uh, for those reasons and many more, I will not be supporting. There are some good bills in this packet of, of four or five or whatever, but the, the main meat of this is a bill that I haven't seen. It's got a lot there, and I can't support it. Thank you. Representative Zolkowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I was proud to support House Bill 114 when it left this body and uh, was looking forward when it left the other body's finance committee because there was a, a fix in, in that bill that actually supports my district. Um, however, with the other body's incorporation of a 43-page amendment essentially rolling the Reads Act into the bill, I rise in strong objection to concurrence on the floor today. I just want to share deep concerns with the underlying changes of, to, of the bill, but to echo many of the comments made tonight that we would be concurring to a very large, complex, and expensive bill without having properly gone through all of the committee vetting process. I want to be clear that my concern about this bill is not in political gamesmanship or achievement, and I would also say that despite some, assertion made, some assertions made by other members of this legislature, the concerns that I've had related to the underlying bill have not been addressed. 
Um, my concerns are rooted in the protection of small schools, Alaska Native children, Alaska Native language speaking students, that such an onerous policy would unintentionally disadvantage these groups to their peers. I'm deeply disturbed by the idea that our body would concur with a bill that removes local control from school districts, passes unfunded mandates, and allows the state of Alaska to interfere into what should be a decision between parents, students, and teachers. I'm, one of, I'm from one of the most rural and economically disadvantaged regions in the entire United States, where homes lack running water and sewer and reliable broadband, and communities perpetually struggle to recruit and retain teachers. I want to echo the comments of my colleague from Dillingham. I also remain very skeptical at the notion that increased testing, be it in the form of reading screeners, is going to solve these underlying inequities and the root causes for the disparities in educational achievement. In fact, I can imagine that these steps would make these disparities worse. I think that there might be some well-rehearsed talking points in this building uh, with, that we may hear this evening on the floor, but my concerns uh, with the version of the bill in front of us are founded on the functions of the bill as assessed in committee. It removes local control, three and a half pages of student retention language, ultimately stating, permission to read briefly, Madam Speaker? Very briefly, because your time is up. Page 32 of the amendment says, if no parent or guardian attends a meeting about a student's progress, that the superintendent or their designee shall make that, shall make that determination. It inserts, uh, it inserts the states into decisions that should be made between students, parents, and teachers uses a screening tool leading to a high stakes decision point on one subject matter of a student's progress, creates a state accountability system to identify problems with literacy that are already well documented, but spending tens of millions of dollars of state funding. It levies unfunded mandates on school Representative districts. Representative Zolkowski, I'm going to have to ask you to. To extend her time given the potentially far reaching impacts on her district. Thank you. There's been Thank you, Representative Zolkowski. Is there any further discussion? Representative Prox. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in support of the bill. Um, does make a lot of significant changes. I allow that. The, hard to say, we've tried for 30 years, maybe, the idea of just sending out money with no accountability um, we've got to try something different. This starts that process, and I think we should move forward with it because they're spending not their own money, they're spending somebody else's money for what? I don't know. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to a similar uh, point, conclusion but for, uh, I think, vastly different reasons. 121 days now, <laughs> this body has had control power of committees to do exactly the vetting that we complained that we did not, were not able to do, and I don't understand. Uh, $60 million was included in the budget and above this BSA, uh, so I don't understand the complaints about um, lack of funding. Madam Speaker, the problem that I have is that from the very beginning of the conversations with the portions of this bill, it has been clear that the Department of Education at the state level has fa felt impotent to address issues that have, have gone unaddressed at the local level for far too long. And this bill represents a power grab by the state to define standards and solve problems that local control should be solving. Madam Speaker, once we lose local control, it is next to impossible to get it back. I doubt very seriously that the parents and the communities outside of the school districts, the administrators and the teachers, really understand what's going on with this bill. And if they understood that the state is seizing control and the, and the ability to uh, define standards for our schools that have, until this point, been defined by local school boards and local processes, they would be just as upset as the rest of many of the Americans down in the lower 48 who are trying to claw back local control from an overreaching state and federal government. Madam Speaker, this is a poster child for the dysfunction that exists within this legislature, and it needs to die. Thank you. Representative Snyder. 
Thank you. I wanted to take the opportunity, thank you, Madam Speaker, um, take my two minute opportunity to continue some of the comments um, that were being made by a colleague of mine whom I, I respect and have, have turned to um, for, for their insights on this issue. Um, we've heard a little bit about um, unfunded mandates um, that this bill would place on, on schools and uh, some significant reporting requirements. And particularly when we're talking about smaller communities, we talk a lot about this concern in the world of public health as well, but uh, significant reporting requirements that can pose privacy issues in our smaller communities. Um, it's, it's much more difficult to maintain privacy when you're in a small community. You can, you can figure out who's who pretty quickly, pretty easily, I think, as, as folks who live in small communities well know. Um, we've not heard as much about some concerns about additional burdens on districts that already have successful language immersion programs. We know children learn at different rates um, with different um, Different metrics are more appropriate when you're talking about kids who are in immersion programs. Um, and I wanted to highlight again th this issue around uh, uh, the remedy that we might be provided for here for underperforming rural and multilingual districts will likely be an urban English speaking, English -speaking uh, reading specialist. Um, I am not convinced that, that that is the answer um, to, the, to the issues that we're facing. And again, you know, we. If we had a bill before us today that was rewriting the criminal justice system, or we had something uh, like HB 91 in front of us again, or we had um, oil tax rewrites here on the floor that had not been through the full process, especially going up through the Finance Committee, I, th I think we'd, we'd be very concerned. Um, and I have the same level of concern here tonight. It, it brings me no satisfaction, but that's how I feel about what we have before us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a further representative story? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I wanted to stand and speak tonight since I serve on the Education Committee. And I really want to uh, share with the body that, um, as we all know, our kids are very capable, but we have an instructional gap um, that has been happening in our state for a long time. We are a big, diverse state with an extremely rich culture. Um, as a result, educating our children is not a one-size-fits-all. Fit, uh, uh, this year, uh, the, uh, this education body in the House um, really put a lot of time into developing the cultural education um, uh, points, uh, some supports, some help, and was really disappointed when the other body came forward with this bill where those weren't included. It's really a top-down model. It doesn't account for the individual needs of our districts and uh, takes away some of the flexibility. I think one of the biggest concerns to me is there are a lot of uh, unfunded mandates in the bill. And we have, as we know, we've had downward pressure on our budgets uh, for the last six years. A uh, $30 increase in the BSA is not going to have uh, special help for teachers who are going to be doing, would be doing individual reading improvement plans. Uh, lots of uh, time needed for professional development to really be uh, teaching the science of reading and a cultural component to that. We have heard from many of our districts who have um, cultural component programs like our Clinkett Culture Language Literacy Program in Juneau and they have incorporated the science of reading with the Clinkett language and uh, this uh, bill currently in front of us falls short in the resources to really do that and so I believe that we wouldn't be able to give the attention to where it is needed, and it puts a lot of pressure um, on our staff, and uh, I wish it was something I could vote for because there are, um, there are some components that I like, but as it's written, I think it will hurt more children than it will help. Thank you. Thank you. Brief it is. Hold on just a second. I'll see if I can get it fast forward to the next little section. They still haven't started anything in the House or the Senate yet for the actual budget budget.
There we go. Representative Tuck. All right, back in. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do rise in support of the changes made in the other body by adopting pre-K and adopting a reading component that really focuses on making sure students can read by the age, by third grade. The uh, Reads Act does um, address the number one strategic goal of the Alaska Board of Education, and that is, quote, support all students to read at grade level by the end of third grade. It does have accountability measures in it. I uh, think it's wrong that people see accountable me measures as, as being some sort of, um, uh, some sort of uh, showing that schools are failing. It's not. It's trying to offer support where support is needed so that we have successes. As was previously mentioned, this does really support students. Even when it comes to progression from grade to grade, it supports students. Currently, we have nothing that addresses retention in state statute. So superintendents or local districts can determine that. And this, in this we are stepping in and, and putting sidebars on that. They can't be held back until third grade. They can't, uh, if English is their second language, they can't be held back. And if they have a disability, they can't be held back. And if they've been held back once before, they can't be held back again. And it's a big focus on the parents. And if not the parents not available, then whoever their legal guardian is. And then if a, a parent happens to show up, then at that time, uh, they can still appeal. But this is an opportunity to really do something. When we see, um, see opportunities like this, I mean, when people are talking about the BSA, well, I got to point out that this BSA increase that we have right here is the best BSA increase that we've seen in 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, all those years combined, because there was nothing. There hasn't been any BSA increase. There hasn't been, this bill is not meant to address teacher retention and teacher um, recruitment. This has everything to address the student and making sure the student has the opportunity to succeed in reading, because we know when a child learns to read, they can read to learn. And it's not an unfunded, unfunded mandate. It's 57 million this year, drops down to 21 million, and increases all the way up until we hit uh, 42 million, roughly six, seven years from now. So that is a significant um, adding support money-wise on whatever these unfunded mandates that people are speaking about. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Further discussion? I'm brief at ease. Okay, another one of those brief at ease moments with them. Give me just a second, see if I can get it fast forwarded again. The house is still milling around and they're not really doing much of anything. Current vote for House Bill 114. Oops, let me go back. I want to catch all of that. Here we go back to order is there further discussion on the concurrent vote for house bill 114 representative drummond thank you madam speaker as a, as co-chair of house education this has been a really long slog we have worked very hard on this bill you heard a previous speaker say we processed over 60 amendments we worked very hard to get as many concerns taken care of as we could. It's unfortunate that our version didn't make it over to the Senate because I think it's a hell of a lot better bill than what has been stuffed into this one. And it's unfortunate, as others spoke of the process, it's a terrible process. And I have to say, after talking about, I believe we have $57 million in the budget outside the formula instead of a BSA that comes back year after year. A, seven, a $30 BSA increase per student, that's an insult. I'm sorry, that doesn't even pay for one book. 
I still haven't decided how I'm going to vote on this bill. I'm really interested to see if anyone else has opinions. The opinions and the observations have been excellent so far. But my primary problem is that a BSA, we, we might as well have gone negative on the BSA, then get $30. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Representative Kaufman. Ma'am, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, <clears throat> this bill has been presented um, to me by those that have worked on it as a, an incremental improvement, and it it may not satisfy all of the wants and needs, um, but, but it is um, viewed as a step forward. I mean, for those of us in Anchorage, uh, we received a communication from no less uh, than Dr. Dina Bishop, who supports this. So. Um, people that, that know things about this seem to support it. Some don't seem to like it, but to me it appears to have merit as an incremental improvement, so I think we should support it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Shragi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I try not to speak to bills too often as I don't think that uh, our speeches on the floor oftentimes make too much of a difference on the final vote tally that's oftentimes determined before we get here to the floor, but um, I'm not sure where the vote's going to go today, and this is a really tough one. Um, you know, I, one of the things I campaigned on, in fact, one of the main things I campaigned on is education. Um, I get emotional every time I talk about it, but I'm, we're trying to start a family, and um, I, you know, one of the big things on my mind, one of the biggest things on my mind is the future of our state and what our schools look like in a decade. And this bill presents an opportunity, I think, for many of the urban districts to really get a leg up and do a little bit of good after, as has been outlined, a long period of stagnant funds for education. And now we get a, as was mentioned earlier, an insulting <laughs> addition to the BSA. And I, I just can't support the bill. We, we, heard, we heard today that it, it doesn't address all our wants and needs. It, it doesn't even address the main one. Teacher retention and retirement, re recruitment and retention is the number one issue in our state. The correlation is there. The causal relationship has been established. When are we going to address the number one issue that affects education in our state and, frankly, public safety in our state, too? This falls far, far short of what we need to be doing for education in our state. And while I, re while I really wish I could support this bill, I, I just can't because of the process, because of the just lackluster effort at supporting education. I get that it does some, some good for some of our schools, but it doesn't do enough. It doesn't do enough good throughout our state. And frankly, you know, if they really wanted this bill to pass, I think they would have included at least a couple of changes from the hard work done in the House Committee, even if they didn't support the final outcome. So um, with that, I'll, I'll just leave it there and uh, vote against the bill when we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House Bill 114 amended, thus adopting Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 114 finance amended Senate. And I do recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to House Bill 114 as amended? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 21 yeas, 19 nays. With 21 yeas and 19 nays, the House has concurred with, with House, House Bill, Bill 14. 14. Holy Mr. crap, Jordan it is. passed! Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the... Um, oh, wait, hang on a second. Let me back up a little bit. Madam Speaker, I move that the... I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote, that the effective date clause, I move the effective date clause, Madam Speaker. Hearing no objection, the clock, effective, no, that. oh, that's right, we didn't have enough votes. Are you ready for the question? Three for these. Right, we 
Oh my God, you guys, are you as shocked as I am that that actually passed with all the opposition that stood up against this bill? Um, so the Reeds Act has now officially made it through the Senate, officially made it through the House other than the concurrence vote, which should be happening here real shortly. Uh, it would be kind of nice to see what, what uh, get, a, get a better view on Louise Stutes there. Uh, let me switch my view. And, uh, yeah, it, it, I was really shocked to just see that happen. I, I, hopefully you guys are just as shocked as I am. So the Reeds Act that has been basically being worked on now for three years that I'm aware of over in the Senate was transmitted over to the House just the last day or so. And uh, the House brought it directly to the floor and they forced a vote on it. And I am so glad that they did uh, because uh, maybe that will help uh, fix some of the education problems we have, like actually having kids that know how to read. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see where this goes next. I'm going to go ahead and hop over to the actual video here and see if I can get us fast forward to where they get themselves back out of this at ease and uh, get us into something a little bit more concrete. It's like, did they even come back for the uh, concurrence vote on this? It looks like they're sitting over there powwowing on whether or not to bring this back to the floor. Holy moly. All right, just keep on plugging away here. I know they were milling around the last time I looked inside. They were sitting at their desk, but they still weren't doing anything. Just keep on scrolling forward. So we're waiting patiently for the Senate or the House to either convene for House Bill 281, 282. We're still waiting for them to decide whether or not to do their voting for that. Uh, you saw at the very beginning of this uh, episode here today I showed the video clip of them uh, oh it looks like they're about ready to get ready to do something here. Are they gonna finally do something? Let's find out. Okay, found it. Back to the very beginning of this thing again. Let's get over to them talking, see what they have to say. Will the house please come to order? Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the effective date clause for uh, committee substitute for Senate committee substitute for House Bill 114 pass the House. Members may proceed to vote. Does any, many, any member wish to change his or her vote? Will, will the clerk please lock the roll? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 30 yeas, 8 nays. With 30 yeas and 8 nays, the effective date clause has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask the unanimous consent that the uh, Senate cons <laughs> can't even speak. Madam Speaker, I move and ask the unanimous consent that Senate Concurrent Resolution 24, the title change resolution for House Bill 114, be taken up as a special order of business. Without objection, are you ready for the question? Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaking to the resolution, you know, there are some bills that go over to the other body and they come back here and, and there's a change or two changes or maybe the title gets a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. We sent over a bill that had a little bit more than a one-line title. And that captures the concept, the, the content of the bill. Uh, the bill came back to us with uh, just shy of 11 lines of, of text just to illustrate how much different the bill came back. And when we, if we, 
approve this title change, what we are doing is we are encouraging that type of legislative process to continue in the future. So I, I think it's more than just today that we're talking about. We're talking about what's going to happen two years from now when we're in this same situation. So I encourage members, if you don't want that process to continue, to please vote no on the title change. Are you ready for the question? Question is, shall Senate Concurrent Resolution 22 pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 25 yeas, 14 nays. With 25 yeas and 14 nays, Senate Concurrent Resolution 22 has passed the House. Representative Thompson? You said twice, current, current Senate Concurrent Resolution 22 when we voted, and you announced the answer at the end, and you said you we have passed Concurrent Resolution 22, and it was 24. Brief it is. Which one was it? So Louise Stutes completely can't even keep track of what bill she's currently working on. Now is misstating the title as 22 when it's supposed to be 24. This isn't the first time she's done this. And that would be a big snafu for the actual records when it comes time for this particular bill by having the wrong bill title in the record in the notes. And uh, so that's a good catch there. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of scary that this continues to keep going on with the house. I've, I've seen it with her more than once. She gets very confused and frazzled. And the later it gets, her she becomes more like Joe Biden every second when that happens to happen. So let me see if I can get this fast forwarded to where the next section of it is. I'm still keeping an eye on where they're at in the actual live session for all of this going on. And uh, every time I go and take a look, it's at ease. And on the cell phone, it just doesn't allow me to rewind what the uh, is, is going on there in the room. And uh, da, 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 da. so as far as I can tell, they haven't really done much of anything here today. Keep on fast forwarding. Maybe something here soon. Chris Tompkins is sitting there talking up front. Uh, Miss Tar, uh, their, their little cozy relationship that uh, Click has with each other. Good old baggage in the back in the corner there. He's doing his own little talking to his little Click. So, okay, so it, it doesn't look like they did much of anything after that because this is, I'm seeing, aha, here we go. All right, moving back just a hair, get it from the beginning, there we go. All right, I will shut up on my end and I will unmute them. Will the House please come back to order? First, I did say uh, Resolution 22 when it was in fact, um, what did they say? I said 22 when in actuality it was 24. But the board read 24, so that's fine. And the, re the title change, the concurrent Resolution 24, failed. Yes, it failed. It, it's um, 27? Yeah. It's a 27 um, threshold. So the title change did not pass the House. 
Free for these. I don't know about you guys, but it sure was getting annoying listening to Louise Stu sitting there clicking the back of her pen. Click, 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 click. It's like, come on now. I mean, don't you realize that's being picked up by the microphone? Show a little bit of brains with you what you're doing there. Uh-oh, the screen stalled out there. What's going on? Uh... Okay, we're at 750 marker, so let's do what I normally do when it starts doing stuff like this. Aha! So we'll go back to the floor session here, bring it back up onto the screen and restart it. It's uh, amazing what happens when you're working with a delayed broadcast. Alright, uh, ooh, they actually look like they got back to doing something there. Let's uh, get it back to where it was uh, prior to them actually stopping here. Oh, come on now. Always seems to slow down at the very end of things here. Tick tock, tick tock. Come on, I want to be able to see this whole thing. Come on, I just want to get back to the beginning of it. Where it stopped at, I mean, we're not too far behind for where they are actually legitimately are right at the moment in this. Who also work in the private sector, um, their, their pensions, our neighbors' pensions are being reduced. Oh, it just will not let me do that little bit there. All right, I guess we're going to have to start from the start. Here we go. Let me uh, unmute it since they are literally live. Hopkins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just to be clear on this, a pension is not an actual pension by definition in the federal law. It also includes 401k, so it impacts all of us here on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, this is something that I do have... work do they realize at some point that they're going to get caught up in the windfall provision so um, elimination of the windfall provision would at a minimum uh, make things more clear and, and maybe help people avoid unpleasant surprises thank you thank you representative Spunholz. thank you there's just uh, there's one point I just want to be um, really clear about that the government pension offset program um, it is really about reducing your Social Security benefits. If you ha have worked both in the private sector and are eligible for Social Security and you've worked in the public sector in the state of Alaska and all public sector employees are not eligible for Social Security. This is a very important distinction. But say, for example, you're a teacher who works nine months of the year for a school um, and then in the summertime you have a private sector job, you're earning Social Security credit or perhaps you, um, become, a, a, you know, become a public employee after working in the private sector sometime you've paid into Social Security, you have earned you know, the right to that benefit just like every other American who pays into Social Security. But because of this government pension offset program, your uh, Social Security benefits are reduced. Which So it's sort of, um, it was designed as a sort of a way of, of avoiding double dipping, but instead has created a system where people who have earned benefits, you know, that every other American gets are not able to get it because they've chosen at some point in their life to go into public service. And that really seems to be a disservice and very patently unfair. And I'm very strongly in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a further discussion? Representative McCabe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The devil must be enjoying his ice cream cone because I find myself in agreement with my esteemed colleague from District 20. Thank you. Further, Representative Drummond. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I have been looking very carefully at this, um, and it actually, um, the rule is if you, have, if you have both a pension and you have contributed to the Social Security system, you have to have 
I think it's 30 years of what they call substantial earnings under the Social Security system to not get whacked by the windfall elimination provision. So think about that. Um, it takes a long time. That's a lot of years of substantial um, pension. And if you have um, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in mm -hmm. a pension program and not 30 years of substantial um, uh, earnings under Social Security, you will get whacked. So I think this is a good bill, and I, um, I think we should vote yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Representative Rauscher. Brief it is. Brief it is. Okay, folks, we are literally live back with them once again, uh, current with where they are at in their feed down there in Juneau. So everything that we are seeing now is live as they are showing it on gavel to gavel. Uh, we only missed about 10 minutes of, it was really just pretty much nothing more than being at ease. And then they finally brought this onto the floor to be heard. And uh, so now they're discussing the pensions and Social Security benefits and such of, of this particular bill. Um, I am completely against anything that is increasing the outgoing to government services. They have a really big spending problem down there and they want to always spend more than they can ever dream or hope of bringing in of their own personal revenue. And every time they do this, that means more of our PFD is being stolen to cover these continuous increases that they have. I was really shocked to see that SB 114, the Reads Act, finally has made its way through both the House and the Senate and will be transmitted to the governor to be signed off on. Um, we will have to wait and see what the outcome of that is going to be. Uh, I semi-concur that uh, maybe they should have been able to look in deep dive a little bit more into this bill there in the House. But I also want to point out the fact that this bill has been three years in the making over there in the Senate. This has been in the news so many times that uh, I can't even calculate the total. And uh, that so this is something that's been needing to have happen for a very, 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 very long time. And you could hear by the statements being made by the opposition who spoke up more than those that were for this bill. The opposition, that you could hear the equity and diversity in their comments. And it's borderline, if you know what you're looking for, it's their way of code words of talking critical race theory being taught within our schools. And the equity and diversity program that they have currently in there is you look at the lowest performing student in the school and the highest performing student in the school and they try to bring that high performers level down to the lowest student so that they have equity in their outcomes um, instead of saying hey you know look at how good this person is doing maybe we should work on things that helps you maybe get closer to that kind of an achievement even if it only means a small minor improvement it should be allowed to happen, but uh, not the way this, the equity and diversity works. Uh, they want to bring you down all to the same level of, of outcomes, um, which it just can't be achieved in the real world. And they know this, but that's what they're trying to teach our kids. It's really prevalent in places like Fairbanks and Juneau. In Anchorage, it crept into the school system full force last year when it got passed through by the uh, school board assembly. And uh, I did live stream those discussions that they had had when the vote got passed. And Donnelly, the only one on the school board there that had put anything forward, that, and it was just simple, very one-line piece of language that no critical race theory would be taught in the Anchorage School District and they would not add that simple one little line into the equity and diversity program that they had passed last year. 
And uh, so that tells you everything that you need to know that uh, the one thing that they claimed the entire time they were trying to pass this there in the assembly that they're not teaching was the only words that they would not allow into that particular change that they had done through the school system there. And now North Pole and Fairbanks, the Fairbanks School, North Star School District, they already instilled all of the equity and diversity uh, several years ago into their school. Um, you saw the big controversies where the male students were going into the female students uh, bathrooms and the female students were getting upset and complaining about that and the male student says well hey you guys are the one that passed the rules that says however i feel like i want to identify that's the corresponding bathroom i'm now allowed to use and he was exercising his right that day he did not feel like a boy he felt like he was a girl and decided to go into their bathroom and uh, it was funny the big stink that came out of that because the girl's family was all upset that this happened well this is what happens when you allow a school board to take over control and you allow the radical left to push their agenda Palmer has had a good example of that going on there for the agenda at play I mean you, you see the moms for social justice and the three uh, council members that have recently been recalled and the trying to rename the colony day uh, colony days and the Christmas uh, that is held every single year trying to rename both of those and those same people that are in moms for social justice those same uh, council members that were recalled they have their fingers in just about every community organization there within Palmer and they are throughout every event that is going on there pushing the three rivers braided three rivers uh, theory that they have what they wanted to rename the colony days to and uh, they're trying to push this systematically through one organization after another after another and because most of the people in Palmer don't even know that these things even exist or they're made up of, of uh, community members that's maybe six or seven people that ever show up to these things they have full control of the dictation on how things are getting changed now going on in Juno so what we got to see is is they gave us a, a, a Joint committee decided that a $2,550 pre-FD was what they wanted to give each and every one of us and a energy rebate check and half of that is dependent upon them passing the CBR vote which requires a supermajority vote from both the House and the Senate to pass that portion and uh, I don't know if they're going to get it. That means that would be a $750 less that we would receive if it doesn't pass personally i hope it doesn't pass i mean why would they want to continue to hand even more pork over to the special interest just so that they can bribe us alaskans to try to feel good about what they've done down there stealing our money now if we were to truly follow what they said and they're giving us 50 percent of our statutory pft that 2550 dollars that means what the Senate had passed was not our actual PFD. It should have been $5,100, not $2,550. Oh, there went the gavel. Will the House please come back to order? Is there further discussion on SJR 12? Will the House please come to order? Is there further discussion on SJR 12? Hearing none, in wrap up, Representative Fields, are you ready for the question? The question is, shall Senate Joint Resolution 12 pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. Representative Prox. Here. 
Representative Merrick. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 36 yeas, zero nays. With 36 yeas and zero nays, Senate Joint Resolution 12 has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the limbo file to take up House Bill 265 and the member from District 16 who explained the changes made in the other body. Representative Spanholz. <laughs> all right, now that we've all got our paperwork here. All right, changes that were made uh, in the Senate to House Bill 265 were to uh, add language that allowed uh, physicians licensed in another state to provide telehealth um, if they're providing a consultation regarding a life-threatening condition, um, and this uh, care is in response to a, an Alaska-licensed uh, physician's uh, reference. Um, two, uh, they added a sunset, uh, sunset language to the uh, payment parity, which is sort of the equal pay for equal care provision for telehealth care on Medicaid uh, for June 30th, 2030. Um, these provisions are subject to a state plan amendment that has to be submitted to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services if necessary. And then there was also a minor technical change recommended by Director Chambers at the um, at the um, Business and Professional Licensing um, Division and some healthcare stakeholders, it corrected some gram grammatical and formatting errors and uh, requires rather than uh, allows the state medical board to recover costs of an investigation of a sanctioned physician that is licensed in another state if they're providing care to Alaskans rather than making it optional and that's so that Alaskan license holders aren't on the hook for uh, bad actors from another state should there be any, hopefully in a very rare condition and we, uh, Anyways, that explains the changes. Thanks. Is there further discussion? In, uh, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to the Committee Substitute for House Bill 265 Finance, thus adopting Senate Committee Substitute for Committee Substitute for House Bill 265 Finance, and recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to committee substitute for House Bill 265? Members may proceed to vote. <coughs> Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 37 yeas, one nay. With 37 yeas and one nay, committee substitute for House Bill 265 has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the effective date clause. Hearing no objection, the effective date clause has been adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the Members go into the limbo file to take up House Bill 168. The member from District 27 will explain the changes made in the other body. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, HB 168 passed this body uh, either unanimously or darn close, and the only change that happened in the other body was to update two references to the Department of Health and Social Services to reflect Executive Order 121 and now say Department of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move it. 
I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House Bill 168, thus adopting Senate Committee Substitute for House Bill 168 Finance, and recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? Question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to House Bill 168, adopting <coughs> Senate Committee Substitute for House Bill 168? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 38 yeas, zero nays. With 38 yeas and zero nays, committee substitute for Senate, for House Bill 168 has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the effective date clause. Hearing no objection, the effective date clause has been adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the Senate, con that Senate concurrent resolution 19, the title change resolution for House Bill 168 be taken up as a special order of business. Without objection, are you ready for the question? The question is, shall Senate concurrent resolution 19 pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 38 yeas, zero nays. 38 yeas and zero nays. Senate current concurrent resolution 19 has passed the House. Brief it is. Chris? Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Do absolutely nothing. Hurry up and wait. Well, I've stuck a peek at what's going on in the Senate over there, and there's actually people starting to show up into the room. Um, I'm thinking maybe 30 minutes to an hour they might actually get something started uh, by 9 o'clock at least uh, hopefully that gives them three hours to go through the budget and uh, so we're gonna have dual budget testimonies or uh, debates going on in the House and the Senate it appears at the exact same time it would not surprise me that this was a strategic plan on their parts to make that happen so that way you really had to pick and choose which body you wanted to watch. So down in the comments right now on Facebook, take a second, I would like you to say which one would you prefer me to be live streaming when they actually go live for House Bill 281, 282, State Capital, Supplemental Budget, uh, Mental Health Budget, PFDs, and the CBR vote. Uh, which did not occur in the original Senate bill because there was no money coming out of the CBR. and uh, But when the Joint Committee got together, they moved our energy rebate check, $750 of that, over to the CBR vote. They also removed all the K-12 through education and university funding over into the general fund budget so that they did not have to have a supermajority vote to get that money there back. Move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the limbo file to take up House Bill 363. The member for the District 37 will explain the changes made in the other body. 63, if my mic is on, is the broadband bill that the body heard just a few days ago. <clears throat> uh, in the other body, the Senate Finance Committee adopted some changes made in the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee, and the changes essentially in three areas. The first one is added uncodified legislative findings that were related to quality affordable broadband. Number two, added two seats to the statewide advisory board, one for a technology neutral consultant and another for an expert in rural energy systems. <clears throat> and the final change was to create a broadband technical working group comprised of eight members, three engineers, one a mechanical, another a civil, the third an aerospace engineer, and then lastly, uh, five members, one in telecommunications, fiber optics, satellite technology, microwave technology, 
and a broadband, broadband industry representative from the advisory board. And with those changes, um, I'd recommend a yes vote. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to committee substitute for House Bill 363 Finance, thus adopting Senate committee substitute for committee substitute for House Bill 363 Finance. I recommend that the members vote yes. Brief it is. Gavel in, gavel out, gavel in, gavel out. So where was I on that? Uh, oh yeah, the half the energy rebate check comes from the CBR now. They removed all the money for K through 12 in the universities over into the general fund, so they only needed a simple majority vote to spend that money. And they moved a bunch of the capital projects, the, the smaller projects that were added into the general fund that specifically targeted the Matsu, and they tied it over into the CBR vote to have that money come from there. So they, they really did tie, they, they did their utmost corrupt blackmail coercion in the joint committee to make sure the they House got the money. Come back to order. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to committee substitute for House Bills 363? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 36 yeas, 4 nays. With 36 yeas and 4 nays, the House has concurred with Committee Substitute for House Bill 363. Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the effective date clause. Hearing no objection, the effective date clause has been adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the limbo file to take up House Bill 226. The member from District 17 will explain the changes made in the other body. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. The changes were uh, small but significant to a handful of people uh, with the title hearing examiner and possibly one administrative law judge. We think there were five individuals approximately who are practitioners of the law and were not uh, encompassed into the language as written. So in section three it now says, and any non-union positions in the executive branch that require admission to the practice of law Etc. Um, so this is this is a friendly change in my view, and I uh, encourage a uh, affirmation of it. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to Committee Substitute for House Bill 226 Finance amended in a, amended effective date failed, thus adopting. Committee substitute for House Bill 226, finance amended, effective date failed, amended Senate. I recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to committee substitute for House, 220, House Bill 226, finance amended, date failed, thus adopting committee substitute for House Bill 226, amended Senate. Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 23 yeas, 15 nays. With 23 yeas and 15 nays, the House has concurred in adopting committee substitute for House Bill 226. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the limbo file to take up House Bill 325. The member from District 22 explain the changes made in the other body. Our 
Representative Rasmussen. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I am incredibly excited today to be able to highlight some of the changes um, in House Bill 325. So um, just to start, I wanted to say thank you to the member from District 19 for her hard work um, and steadfast dedications to victims of sexual assault and domestic violence, which we were able to um, bring into House Bill 325 and the other body. Um, I also wanted to thank the Department of Law, especially John Skidmore and Casey Schroeder for all of their diligence on this work on this bill and um, all of the Senate who voted unanimously to support our uh, final version before us. We, um, the changes include a requirement for uh, registered sex offenders to petition um, and notify the courts uh, when they have a name change. Um, and then it also includes a lifetime revocation of teaching certificates for those who are convicted of crimes, um, including the distribution or possession of child pornography. And Madam Speaker, um, if you would indulge us, I'd really like uh, the member from District 19 to explain the final changes. Thank you. Representative Tarr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am very, very pleased to be able to present the changes made in the other body tonight. The remaining changes in the bill include three critically important items for addressing sexual assault in our state. The first is to modernize our more than 40-year-old definition of consent from a no means no, but not even that is good enough. You have to literally fight the person off and be able to show that to affirmative consent, a yes means yes. So we now in the state of Alaska will join dozens of other states in modernizing this and recognizing what we've learned about trauma since we passed that statute more than 40 years ago. And what this affirmative consent will really recognize is the trauma responses we know are fight, flight, or freeze. And for 40 years, more than 40 years, that freeze response has not been able to be included in a sexual assault case. So this is, this is massive. This is, this is a massive, important change we are making tonight. The second thing we're going to do is criminalize the behavior of rape by fraud. This is an individual who impersonates another individual known to the victim to obtain consent. That's currently a behavior that is not criminalized. And it's a circumstance where um, the, the most striking and sad example I can share from actually happened in my district where a woman was in bed, and her husband had inadvertently left the door open. A man came in and got into her bed, pretending to be her husband, in initiated sexual um, contact. She participated, thinking she was engaging in a sexual contact with her husband, only to find out it was this person who had come into her house in the middle of the night and gotten in bed with her, impersonating her husband. What the state of Alaska says right now is that she consented to that. And I just think that all of us would agree if a strange person got into our bed pretending to be a person who would be in our bed and sexually assaulted us that, that we should have a legal recourse and be able to seek justice. So that's the rape by fraud provision. And the third is so exciting. Since 2014, we've been working on a multi-year rape kit reform initiative. And the last piece of that initiative is in this legislation when we first started working on it, it took more than two years to process rape kits in the state of Alaska. Working with the crime lab and other public safety professionals, we moved that back in prior legislation to one year to allow them to get staffed up. And today, we will move that to six months. And we will ensure that we have a more victim-centered approach, that survivors of sexual assault will be able to know who their perpetrator is in a much shorter amount of time. And what we all care so much about is that those Alaskans who have experienced a very violent and horrific crime will be that much sooner on their path to healing and recovery. And for that, this is a very, very important bill that we can all be proud to support. And I enthusiastically, proudly, with so much gratitude to the member from Sand Lake for letting me participate in this presentation tonight, ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there Representative Vance? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm amazed that uh, the representative from District 19 was able to get through that speech without joining the crying caucus. <laughs> I may wreck it for everybody. Um, I've, I've worked on, um, on her bill the past several years in state affairs and judiciary committees, and it's, it's such a daunting task to work on 
criminal justice. And um, in moving, moving um, House Bill 5 out of committee this, this year, I realized that we worked so hard to get everything just right. And it's very frightening. And I realized, I, I saw the picture of the scales of justice for the first time. That's what we seek with every decision that we take in this building is finding the right balance on those scales. And I think this, this bill, along with um, the domestic violence statute and um, HB5, the rape by fraud, but importantly, the consent provision helps balance that out much more than we ever have been in the state of Alaska. And um, I think we need to recognize all of the, um, the, the women and the men who have been watching and waiting, hoping for us to make this change for a long time. And so, um, Katie, you, your voice has been heard. Every other best friend and sister and daughter, you're being heard. And we, we hope that this helps our legal team provide justice. We know that it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's a step in the right direction that says that, um, that your consent must be granted. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Representative Spunholz. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Thank you so much to the member from Sand Lake and the member from Mountain View for your tremendous work on this. Um, justice has been in short supply for women for a very long time um, in our country. And I think this is um, the, the progress that is represented in this work is, ref, uh, is a reflection um, of both of your tenacity on behalf of uh, the women of Alaska, but also a reflection of the fact that representation matters and that having women at the table, having these conversations about what impacts women is really important, just like it's important to have people of color sitting at the table to represent issues, to address issues that impact them. Women need to be at the table when it comes to addressing issues that disproportionately impact women. And nobody fights for women like women. And nothing, nobody's fought for women, the women of Alaska, like the women of Mountain View and Sand Lake have. And I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House Bill 325, thus adopting House Bill 325 amended Senate, and recommend that the, voter, that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? Question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to House Bill 325? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 38 yeas, zero nays. With 38 yeas and zero nays, House Bill 325 is amended. <laughs> Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the effective date clause. Hearing no objection, the effective date clause has been adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the court rule change. Hearing no objection, the court rule change has been adopted. Are you ready for the question? Mr. <laughs> Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that Senate Concurrent Resolution 27, the title change resolution for House Bill 325, be taken up as a special order of business. Without objection, are you ready for the question? The question is, shall Senate Concurrent Resolution 27 pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? 
Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 38 yeas, zero nays. With 38 yeas and zero nays, Senate Concurrent Resolution 27 has passed the House. Brief it is. Can someone please, 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 please do me a favor and take Can Louisa Stutz's pin away from her? I mean, seriously, take it away from her. If I have to listen to that thing, click one more time, I think I might go insane. Um, I, she just has no concept of her surroundings and what her little st stuff does. It just annoys the hell out of me. It's kind of like Nancy Pelosi when she's talking and she's playing with her false teeth, popping them in and out in her mouth, putting them in a place while she's talking to you or talking to us when she's giving speeches and whatnot. So very interesting domestic violence. Uh, this bill has been working several years through. This all started uh, back when they, for the first time, I believe, in Alaska's history, we had removed a sitting judge by voting them out of office uh, through the ballot box. And uh, that has never happened before, and that was because of the judge's verdict for, I believe it was a person that had masturbated and, and uh, left his uh, specimen um, next to the person and on top of the person. and. He had been given a really light sentence by the judge, caused a lot of outrage in the state, uh, knowingly so. But sadly, the judge's uh, ruling on that particular case, if I remember correctly, he was following the law. And uh, because he didn't rewrite the law from the bench as was being demanded, um, the, the, just as we've seen with many other things, they all got up in protest and demanded that uh, he be fired and then they did a big rallying um, around the state and a lot of money got put into it to, for the first time in Alaska's history, actually got a sitting judge to be removed by the ballot box. Something that I wish would happen with many, many, many of those long-term judges that have been sitting on the bench here in Alaska for so many years um, that there is one too many of them out there that are still living in the 70s with their mentality and thinking and uh, they try to apply that into modern day so it looks like they have all bailed out of the room there and uh, that must mean that they might be getting close to actually having the Senate or bringing the uh, actual budget onto the floor watching them all escape like they are currently doing. I'm taking a quick peek here on my phone to see where the Senate floor session actually is sitting at. And uh, I don't see no number change on the actual number of people watching that one right at the moment. So that must mean they haven't quite gotten started yet. Uh, nope, they haven't got started yet, but there is a lot more people in the room than what was there just a little while ago. So it's going to be interesting to watch what happens here today. Only highlight that I'm aware of that has happened coming out of the house since I've been able to watch this. And you can now see them all taking photo ops there in the background. Uh, they they, they got to get there. Their pictures in um, for finally passing the domestic violence uh, portion of the uh, bill that they just got completed. And take note at the people that are standing there. Uh, very, very few, if any, of the non illegal binding caucus that is a part of their majority is in the room and uh, that is back there in that group that's just kind of how they end up treating all of these people when it comes right down to it so that i don't understand why we are having this quick little photo op in the middle of what they've got going on this should be reserved for the very end of the day when they are all done with their legislative business this is ridiculous what i see going on there but uh Hey, you know, this is a one step towards uh, protecting our uh, 
populace out there from domestic violence so I guess this is a a moment we should all be celebrating but uh, I do find this a little this is over the top what they got going on in the background right there right now and uh, we really should be thinking about that so the Reeds Act passed it was a very narrow vote there for that actually passing I believe it was uh, 21 to 19 for the passage of the Reeds Act which was again like I said that was really shocking to see that that had actually made its th way through on the vote uh, yep 21 to 19 was the vote for the Reeds Act so the read by three that has been in the works for the last three years now uh, they didn't hesitate to pass giving bonuses to the attorneys um, that was interesting to watch that one there is many many other bills that they have currently been passing out there in both the Senate and the House this has been the most amount of bills I have ever seen pass through both legislative bodies at one time and I have been watching them down there in Juneau for the last past five years so the, the, they, this is kind of gives you an indication how worried they really are about this upcoming election season and what they are going to do when it comes time for them to actually make it and uh, for for elections my opinion just about everything that we see going on here today everything that we've seen been going on for the last two weeks has all been a very choreographed behind the scenes manipulative show that they have put on and the whole intention was to buy votes looks like they're back in again I thought it was 116 Well, that didn't take them long to jump back into an at ease. Uh, I, I thought for sure they had just gaveled in there. So, oh, there it goes. All right, back to it. To order. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that Representative Merrick be excused from the call of the House today. Hearing no objection, the member has been excused. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into limbo file to take up House Bill 291 and the member from District 19 to explain the changes made in the other body. Representative Tarr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I am just going to briefly introduce this and ask the bill sponsor of the underlying bill that got added in to tag team in the way that we've been doing here on a couple of these. Um, because, unfortunately, I, I don't feel like I could potentially do it justice. But I, what I can tell you, the original bill that we had for the Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, um, all of those parts reta were retained. And then the bill um, replaces the Alaska Criminal Justice Commission with the Alaska Criminal Justice Data Commission and extends the sentence for this commission to June 30th, 2029. Um, that's on your sheet. I feel like um, at this point, it'd be better to turn it over to the underlying um, bill sponsor, the member from District 21, who might be able to provide some additional information on the addition. Thank you. Representative Clayman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The underlying bill that the member from District, or from Mountain View is referencing is uh, House Bill 183, which, which as part of the sunset of the Alaska Criminal Justice Commission creates the Alaska Criminal Justice Data Analysis Commission. Uh, I want to make specific reference to the our auditor, Chris Curtis. Is Representative Clayman. Oh. Thank you. Sorry about that, Madam Speaker. Uh, do I need to start over, or did you get? That would be nice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, the uh, the what is added into the bill is the Alaska Criminal Day, Criminal Justice Data Analysis Commission, which is which is the new entity that's been created at the sunset of the Alaska Criminal Justice Commission. The Alaska Criminal Justice Commission was audited, and our auditor Chris Curtis made very specific recommendations. Uh, she recommended that the recommendation function of the Criminal Justice Commission should not continue 
for two reasons. One was that the legislature had stopped following any of the recommendations and the commission had stopped providing very many recommendations. And so, and because A, the legislature realized they didn't need to follow them and they weren't following the recommendations and the data showed that the following those recommendations dramatically declined in the later years of the commission. She did, however, permission to read, uh, Madam Speaker, from the audit. Permission granted. Uh, what, what Ms. Curtis wrote was, although we recommend sudden setting the commission, we do not recommend terminating its data collection and analysis functions. Objective evidence regarding the effectiveness of the criminal justice system and laws governing the system are critical to future policy decisions. Legislation will be required to maintain the commission's data and analysis functions if the commission sunsets. So the commission did sunset at the end of the last fiscal year and they're in their wind-up year. And so this creates the Criminal Justice Data Analysis Commission, which specifically has no recommendation functions. Um, and, and so what, what it has is it has, uh, the board actually adds victim advocates and, and creates membership on the board that ensures there be a balance of different voices, particularly focused on law enforcement voices and victims, victim representation voices, so that those folks are going to be engaged in the discussions. Uh, support from this has come from the Net Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. And this is, I think, a very positive step because first and foremost, there will be no recommendations coming from the commission. And second, it will make sure that, that we have, have a reasonable collection of data and that, that data will be available to us as policymakers in the years moving forward. So I would encourage a yes vote because I think both the, the Commission on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault and the Data Analysis Commission will serve the future interests of Alaska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Great for days. Come on now, I'm trying to make myself something to eat for dinner, go to another at ease, get the music. So more and more and more pork added into the budget, left and right, every time I turn around, they just keep on adding in more and more and more. I'm not saying that what they're doing isn't a good thing, but when does the spending stop? When do they start putting the majority of Alaskans ahead of special interests like giving raises to attorneys out there or all the raises that they have given are the bonuses and the pension programs that they want to add money in and give it to them give 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 we want more we want more um, you can't stop giving us enough I mean anybody that's been keeping track of like HB 55 and the increase of benefits to bringing back the tier programs that we spent many 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 legislative sessions in the past get working hard to get removed from the budget it's just a it just it doesn't end um it's got to stop somewhere and uh i had I had to run across the room there real quick. Sorry about that. Listening to that phone there in the background, I'm sure you might have probably hearing me double there going on. And uh, but yeah, no, I mean, where does the bloated spending end? Uh, that pension program that they spent all those years removing and getting rid of it was costing our states billions and billions in deficit. In fact, there's still four billion dollars left that they're still in the hole for the pension programs that they're still trying to recover. I remember when I first started paying attention to this and uh, we're going back almost seven years now, they used to be 20 billion dollars in the hole. And that just gives you an idea of how much money that they have been rolling into these that program, the, the pensions program, trying to shore it back up to where it was back into the positives and back out of the negative and now they want to pass more same type that had got us into the deficit in the first place that had wiped us out um i, I don't know about the rest of you but when it comes to retirement uh, i was always raised that that was my responsibility if i wanted to have one i needed to start putting money away i needed to start investing um, making sure that I had a retirement 
Well, you know, I'm just like a lot of many other people out there. I, most of my life I spent working hand to mouth. So what I made was going right back out the door. I don't have much that's going out towards punchins and everything else like that. But you don't see me whining with my hand, whining with my hand out saying, hand me more money, please, um, for, uh, for something that uh, they didn't necessarily earn. We're just giving them doubling whatever they put into their own contributions. So that would be really nice on my end, you know, for every $100 that I put away into my savings account, the state pays me another $100 from our money that they stole in to give me another 100 bucks towards my retirement. I mean, I really do wish I had people just handing me money like that. Uh, I work harder than a lot of those people that are down there in Juno. And they, they make more money than I do and uh, do a lot less work. I, I really got to figure out something better to do with my life, I guess, if I can't make a good, decent income like they do to be corrupt. Oh, that's it. That's why I can't make a good, decent income like they do. I can't be bought and paid for. Uh, I, I won't sell out and compromise my morals and values for what they want to have going on. That's one of the reasons why both the Democrat and Republican Party don't like me and don't like my page. Um, a lot of Republicans say, oh, they do like what I do. They do like what I say. Uh, but when it comes time, do they want me in the room live streaming and recording and letting other people know what they're saying? No. The invitations all stopped here uh, about a year and a half ago, I stopped receiving invitations to things from the Republican Party because for some reason they no longer wanted me in the room streaming what they had going on. And when I do show up to events, I, I like one that I had shown up to here just two nights ago, I'm told by the person that was presenting at the public event for the School of Government that minutes before I'm supposed to hit that start button to start streaming it for ranked choice voting that the RNC committee refused to allow that to happen and even the school of government where it was being held at they weren't allowed to live stream it either so they just did a quick uh, stream of their opening prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance and then they did the comment section at the very end where people in the audience asked their own questions they had asked me to stick around for that and I'm going well no I was here for the ranked choice voting the explanation behind what that is and how that is supposed to be working out and uh, I wanted to stream that to you my audience out there so that you guys too could get educated about the ranked choice voting and get a good idea of, of how ranked choice voting actually works and but they told me I wasn't allowed to stream it this isn't the first time this has happened I mean I've had the Democrat Party do the exact same thing to me I started trying to show up several of their different events here recently in the past and present and uh, as soon as they see me come and walk and I'm not allowed I'm not even invited into the room um, they say that uh, sorry you're not a registered Democrat you're not allowed to be here it's kind of the response I have been getting from that direction at least Republicans let me in the room um, even though they won't let me stream their stuff they'll at least let me in the room to listen to what's going on if I want to stick around but the Democrat Party on the other hand they don't want me nowhere there they think I'm the opposition well they need to learn and so does the Republican Party I don't work for either one of them they I'm not I paid I am myself I have my own moral values and I have very conservative outlooks on things and if it does not benefit the majority I'm usually not for it. There's very few things that benefit only the minority that I would stand behind. And uh, there, there has to be limits to what you're willing to do. Kind of like when the minority wants me to forget what science is. They want me to not understand science. They want me to believe that feelings are something that are supposed to outweigh actual scientific information you know stuff that's been proven with the scientific theory that turns it into reality kind of like gravity and Newton and the apple on the head and all of those other good little things out there that we have learned over time 
and that you know men are men and women are women and it's very confusing when you try to tell me that they are not uh, I, I mean I love to see the actual science that proves that to me so today we have seen the house actually pass the uh, bill that pays for education um, the Reeds Act and something that has been being worked on now for several years I'm going by everybody escaping out of the house right now that that means that they are literally working on probably bringing HB 281 finally to the floor and I know I said I was gonna stick with the house here real quick but I'm gonna pull up the Senate here on my phone is what I'm doing at the moment I want to see where they are at in their session there in Juneau. Have they actually started bringing the stuff to the floor? Um, no, they're kind of doing like what the, the House was doing. If you guys would like me to switch over to the Senate right now, they're reading in other bills. APOC report referendums, recall contributions is what they've got on the floor right now. If you want to see me go over to the Senate's version of what they've got going on and come back to the House, leave it down in the comments right now and I will swap over. Otherwise, I will stick here with the House and we'll continue on with them. Uh, make it quick. Make up your minds. Where do you want me to go right now? The House is out of the room, but the Senate is doing stuff on the floor as we speak. So... Oh, I've got a couple of people over on YouTube that have just told me to swap over. Okay. Uh, all right, I am going to swap over just for a little bit, and I am going to pull up the house on my phone. And uh, because I promised the house would be the one that I stream first today for the actual budget. And so let's bring up the Senate here real quick. And we'll come back here to the house. And as soon as they get back onto the floor, I will bring them back up. But the Senate has definitely got action going on on the floor right now. So let's get them onto the screen. There we go. And I'll shut up and get myself uh, self off of the picture here so that you can hear what's going on with them. Us and my friend from Eagle River. That, that allows us to actually tell the public we care. We care that there are limits. We care that elections shouldn't be bought by the highest bidder. And in fact, what it says to us is that we trust each other to push forward the best possible legislation and hope that that legislation passes as most of the bills in this body do by a near unanimous vote. With that, I am absolutely supporting this, uh, opposing this amendment and supporting this additional language, regardless of the fact that it never came before any committee I sat on. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Minority Leader. Additional comments on amendment number one. Yes, Senator Olson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Having been here for the last over 20 years, I lived through the uh, period when the Senator from Juneau talked about warrants or search warrants being executed. In fact, I was up in Golovan when I got a phone call from my chief of staff who was living here in Golovan and stating that the FBI agents were at the door wanting to execute the search warrant and wanted me to know what to do. Um, we, those of us that lived through that period of time or, or had our political career active during that period of time uh, remember some of the people that were arrested and served time. Uh, many of them have passed on, but there's, those f memories are still fresh in our minds as we look at the option or look at the things that have happened and can happen that cause um, things like this to go on. And because of that, you know, it's often very careful that um, we look at what our, how we're gonna be voting and what kind of action happens as was pointed out by the, by the uh, co-chair of finance that there needs to be some type of limits put on there. It's not a free for all because otherwise uh, the person with the most money will, will probably prevail and has a stronger chance of prevailing. And so because of that, I will be voting against this amendment. Thanks, Senator Olson. Other comments on amendment number one? Seeing none, wrap up Senator Wilson. 
That brings us to the question. Shall amendment number one pass the Senate? Senators may proceed to vote. Does any senator fail to vote? Secretary will lock the roll. Do any senators wish to change their vote? Secretary. Okay, Hughes, Nady A. Secretary will record and tally the vote. Seven yeas, 13 nays. So on a vote of seven yeas and 13 nays, amendment number one has failed to pass the Senate. Madam Secretary. There's an amendment number two by Senator Wilson on members' desks. Senator Wilson. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. President, I'd like to move amendment number two. Brief at ease. Gosh darn them, every time I turn around, they either go at ease, like I said a little bit ago, I'm sitting here trying to get myself something to eat and listen in on what's going on on the House floor session at the same time to make sure that they didn't have nothing new happening there, and now I get to smell my finished cooked meal here while I talk to all of you, making my tummy growl just a little bit more. Another long day in my world, another bright and early 6 a.m. wake up call and I worked all the way up until about 6 p.m. this evening and was supposed to uh, do a little bit more when I got here but noticed that they were actually getting ready to begin the sessions for the actual budget debate I just didn't figure they were going to take this long to actually get to that so it kind of is it's really telling where we are standing where we are at right now with them down there in Juneau. Um, so what is the Senate currently doing at the moment other than milling around? Did that bill actually pass? I, I was a little sidetracked. They're doing my food and uh, <laughs> hmm. Ah, I probably should have muted the sound there so I could eat that. Got to get done. My stomach just won't stop growling. I really needed to put something in it really fast. So we're watching the Senate section right now, session, and uh, they were discussing, I believe it was uh, HB 157 or SB 157, the APOC uh, contributions and everything else for our elections. Uh, from what I've seen of the bill, I'm not very impressed with it, and... But uh, seeing who the loudest opposition is to this bill, I think it might be a great idea to actually get it to pass. Because anything that can get them up on their soapbox saying hell no, hell no to, just like we saw earlier with the SB 114, the Reeds Act bill, and them getting up on their soapboxes there saying one after another after another, trying to use critical race theory as their reasoning behind why they were going to do something. And uh, it's, it's kind of flooring and telling when you, you hear those kind of comments coming out of legislators that that's where they want to go with the discussion. I know they disguised it as equity and diversity, but in all reality, if you listen to what they're saying and you've been watching enough news out there, you know the difference between giving somebody equality and giving somebody uh, diversity has always been the code words for here's our new racist agenda that's going to call everybody a racist that is not of a specific color and these people need to know that they are and we're going to teach that in school because in school they're not being taught the right right things parents out there are because of the color of their skin are automatically racist so are their children that's an infant doesn't even know how to say gag gag goo goo yet and they have already labeled that child racist based all on the color of their skin and so and to watch the outright stand up on their soapbox beat their thumb uh, chest uh, for trying to get things to happen and so, oh, I just got a report that the APOC in the Senate 
is uh, up in second reading right now for amendments. So that I, if you keep up on the different bills that are going on out there, you can always get notifications from them down in Juno where they stand at. It's kind of ironic, though, that I am just getting that notification that they're entering into the second reading, considering the second reading started quite a while ago. And uh, they already started working on amendments. So that just tells you how slow the process really is down there in Juno when it comes to these kind of bills and items that they need to do. I'm pulling back up the house here really quick and seeing what's going on over there. Oh, the looks like the house actually got back into session there. So let's get them back up on the screen here. And uh, let's forget about the Senate because they had a, one that was a lot more in what I want to listen to, and I'm sure you do too. It's House Bill 291. Uh, that's the do domestic violence, uh, another extension of that particular bill. So let's get it to where it's actually starting there and we'll get the volume already up on the screen so you'll be able to hear everything that is going on. Uh, bum, bum, bum. And it should be right after this. Ms. Stutes is getting up there to her podium. She is hustling like crazy. And you're probably listening to that stupid elevator music in the background right now. I should have waited to turn that on. There we go. Come over here. <laughs> we are pushing that button. Will the house please come back to order? Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that the House concur. Well, before I do that, Madam Speaker. All right, Madam Speaker, here we go. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments oh, to. Oh, oh, oh. Brief it is. All right, took a second to get what was there in my mouth. Oh, there went the gavel. Representative Johnson, we are in discussion on um, 291. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to first of all say that I do truly appreciate the um, Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, and I do want to make sure that we, in no, in no way would we um, not want to extend um, their mission and their board. But I do have some concerns with the bill that has been put into it, which is the, the, the uh, criminal justice, it should be the sunsetting of the Criminal Justice Commission. Uh, and it's and according to the, the auditor who recommends that we uh, sunset the Criminal Justice Commission. This is the commission that was set up to um, examine and, and to implement uh, SB 91. So um, that we repealed that failed policy um, a couple years ago. And the auditor recommends that we don't we don't really have a purpose for it anymore. Now this bill actually tries to recon, re, reconstruct or reinstitute a board. It's similar, but not the same as the board extension that we have. And I I really have difficulty seeing where this is efficient. Um, I see I see that the the um, Auditor recommends that we have do continue to collect the anal the data and the an analysis. Um, but in 1975, permission to glance at my notes, Madam Speaker. 1975, the Alaska Legislature set up the UAA Justice Center. It was established by the legislature and has a mandate to provide 
statewide justice-related education, research, and service. So sometimes we set these things up and then we kind of forget that we set them up and why we set them up. Um, this is an organ. This is a um, something. Uh, a, a this is a research center that can receive the data and analysis that is um, being suggested that we keep. In fact, that's exactly what it's made to do: is to to um, keep track and to um, be there for us and others as a re as a resource. Um, on research and criminal justice in Alaska. So we also, so the Alaska Justice Information Center Steering Committee, I just wanted to compare what that is. So like, again, we set that up, uh, like I said, we set that up in 1975. The Alaska, oh my goodness. Um, isn't there like three bills in here I can speak to? Well, <laughs> really, uh, let me let me just say that we I, I would like to uh, to wrap up that and, and just say that there are there is reasons we have an opportunity to sunset something that we have the auditor recommends it and I I believe that we may may have desires to take care of some issues but with recidivism but adding adding Johnson. to our failed policy does is not going to work thank, thank you representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, mean, I, I do believe that the importance of this is probably greater than can be summed up in, in just two minutes. Um, I, I know that the maker and presenter of the bill uh, has good intentions um, and talked about the fact that the Justice Commission is being trained. It's no longer going to be making recommendations. Um, but I come to a very different conclusion when I read the bill. Uh, I find that the majority, it seems, of the criminal justice statute is retained. Uh, some of it's it's gone, but then we add things like we find on page six. We're asking them to review the information collected under the subsection to identify areas for improving. And then, upon request, make recommendations for improving criminal uh, criminal sentencing practices and criminal justice practices including rehabilitation and restitution, which sounds awfully similar to what they were doing when they gave us SB 91. And as that was one of the issues that most severely impacted my district over the last several years, I am not interested in this commission ex extending and continuing under an, a different name. Um, yes, some of the data is good, I think, the center and others can help provide that data. Do we need to keep the Criminal Justice Commission? Is it worth changing the, the, the plate on their door to keep what worked so poorly for our state? I would say no. Um, e even though maybe the other bill is, is appealing to some members, I would ask that we vote no. I would ask that when it comes time to change the title, we also vote no on the title change. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kirka. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the member from District 10 and the member from Palmer kind of stole some of my thunder. I wanted to reemphasize that this commission didn't just monitor and implement the, at, at SB 91, but they actually uh, they gave us SB 91. And I want to emphasize that again. And um, the auditor did recommend disbanding them. And I guess to sum up, and put it in, in just a few words. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig, Madam Speaker. We need to, we need to kill this thing. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, doth protest, but I think I protest in futi futility. Um, I think I supported the, uh, the extension of the uh, Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, and I opposed the extension on the Alaska Criminal Justice Commission. And now both of them have been included in uh, a bill before us to concur on. And this is, it, it is inappropriate to present this to us. Every other commission or board that we're asked to vote on, on concurrence has always come in just a single, single uh, bill, S single subject, one, one commission per bill. And now we have combined both of them in and I, I can't vote for one and not for the other. 
So I guess I'm going to have to vote no on both of them. Thank you. Representative Josephson. Thank you. Um, I don't know that anyone disliked SB 91 more than I did. I offered 13 of the 30 amendments brought to a vote to uh, try to fix it. And um, I, I, I'll tell you that I'm not an expert. Uh, heard I, We had one hearing that I heard uh, on the continuation of the commission in a new data analysis gathering uh, set of duties. And I didn't hear anything in those discussions that gave me any pause at all. So if that is some assurance, I can tell you I found SB 91 disturbing, fought it, and I think this commission is necessary, and I saw nothing that gave me any concern. Thank you. Representative Wool. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, unlike other bills today, both of these bills uh, were heard in House Finance and passed out of House Finance. So I, I can't say I didn't hear them, and, and I supported both of them. I, um, on the subject of SB 91, I know that this commission made a lot of recommendations that helped um, form that bill, along with others. And uh, my colleague to the left previously stated no one, he thought no one disliked that bill more than he did. I, um, I didn't dislike it immensely. I, I think it never really got a good chance, and I think it was, it was panned before it was even put into effect, and it wasn't given the right um, resources and uh, other factors as well. But regardless, we still have a lot of issues with our criminal justice system that have not gone away, even though SB 91 has pretty much gone away. We still have a lot of recidivism. We still have a growing prison population. We still have problems with uh, integration and uh, reintroducing people back into the population. And so I, I think the uh, data collection is very needed. Uh, the representative from Palmer mentioned another uh, UAA-based group that does similar work. We heard in, in committee that they do similar work, but they dovetail. They're not doing the identical work, and we've heard that uh, from in testimony. So I support this uh, concurrence, and uh, I support both the underlying bills. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Edgman. Yes, yeah, speaking in support of concurrence, I want to just point out a couple of things. Uh, first off, I was here when Senate Bill 91 was passed. I was here when its precursor, Senate Bill 64, was passed. And I can tell you it was a legislature and the many forces that revolve around all that we do that brought that bill to head. So to, to imply that uh, any task force or commission foisted upon the legislature is wholly inaccurate. Um, secondly, I'd like to point out that the UA Justice Center um, the criminal justice data analysis gathering uh, uh, group should that uh, pass here momentarily, um, in, in my view, are complementary to a lot of what we've already done. We passed a bill earlier um, increasing attorneys' pay. We, we passed a bill uh, strengthening some badly needed laws in terms of assault on women. We've increased pay for troopers. I think to to put this uh, data analysis gathering uh, uh, work group together, which, by the way, only will provide recommendations. It's it's not coming forth with the with uh, you know any sort of the teeth that the previous commission had. I think plays an integral part in the whole puzzle of solving and making our criminal justice system that much more stronger. So, with that, I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Brief it is.
running around with my head cut off here in the house trying to get things done on top of every time they go at ease. This time they caught me out in the yard trying to get firewood hauled in. So I apologize about the music going on there. So what I'm gathering about this particular bill is, is the only thing that is liked about it is the data collection. But the actual commission committee that is what the big opposition here, they're the ones that brought the studies together that brought us that very failed, disastrous SB91 crime bill that had the revolving door of criminals getting locked up and released before the ink was even dry on the paperwork from the police officers that had arrested them. No more than or put them behind bars to have them back out to picking them up less than 24 hours later for stealing another vehicle or so on and so forth. You guys all remember that prime spree, the one that the ex-disgraced Me Too Mayor er Ethan Berkowitz had announced that as long as you're inside before midnight and uh, before 11 p.m. and 3 a, uh, 6 a.m., you'll be safe. Is there further discussion on uh, committee substitute for House Bill 291? Yes. Representative Prox. Speaking. Brief it is. So we. Back to order. Representative Prox. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in opposition to concurring with the Senate bills, or with the bills from the other body. Rather, I find the comments made by the representative from Palmer compelling. The service or the function that this commission would be providing, both the data gathering and analysis, I guess, could certainly be performed by the university. It is a function of a university to do those sort of things. And um, it's kind of an ongoing thing. It melds in well with their criminal justice program and et cetera. And the separate commissions, don't know, sometimes they get into advocacy rather than objectivity. Of course, I suppose you could accuse a university of doing the same thing. But at any rate, I don't think we need to du duplicate that. I think it could be accomplished within the university and um, probably reduce some expense for the state and confusion in policy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Representative Fields. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. In my first term here, I voted to repeal what remained of SB 91, so uh, I didn't defend that law and I disagreed with a lot of it. I did want to share that I've actually sat through these commission meetings and um, for colleagues who haven't just wanted to share what it's like, you have people in the court system, um, you have prosecutors, you have police officers, you have citizen and faith-based groups who help people with reentry, and um, you do have statisticians from the university, and I think statisticians have a role. But you know, when you when you get people together um, who work at every level of the criminal justice system, from the police officer who arrests someone to the prosecutor who's prosecuted them maybe a judge or a retired judge who, who has the, the opportunity to, to connect someone with a therapeutic court. Um, we don't have enough capacity in the therapeutic courts. Um, when, you, when you have people from DOC who talk about getting people ready to re-enter successfully so they don't go back to prison because recidivism is such a large problem in terms of costs, you know, I think that forum has a lot of benefits and my observation is that it wasn't really driven by any agenda. The only agenda was um, just having fewer people commit crimes and fewer people be in jail. Um, I think we can use that data and make our own choices about policy. So um, I do support it because of that bringing people together, which is, is just not served by any other group in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Is there Representative Drummond? Thank you, Madam Speaker. We need data to be able to make decisions. I'm absolutely in favor of this bill. On the other hand, I'm missing every other page in this document, Madam Speaker, and so are a lot of other people. So when I went to look at page six, as the member from um, District 10 referred to, it wasn't there. 
And I know that it's not there in the packets of the uh, members around me. So I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on this bill because I don't have the data. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Eastman, you rise to a question? I rise to a point of order, Madam Speaker. Representative Eastman. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, uh, I rise to a point of order. Um, I, I believe I, we need to draw attention to Alaska Statute 4466060, uh, subsection E, and that specifically actually prevents us from passing this bill. It says not more than one border commission may be continued to reestablish in any legislative bill and the Border Commission must be mentioned in the title of the bill, and it uh, specifies that the Committee of Reference may, in fact, you know, put forward the bill to extend. But in, in Section 14, we have uh, a sunset date for the uh, Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, and then immediately after, we have a sunset date, a separate sunset date for uh, Section 15, which is the um, Criminal Justice Commission now being renamed the Alaska Criminal Justice Data Analysis Commission. And this statute, you know, is one of those few times where we actually can't pass a bill unless we change this statute if we want to go ahead and put two different extension dates into the same piece of legislation. I think actually we're, we're not supposed to do it. I think one of the, the reasons is because, you know, each commissioner board should be treated separately on its own merits. Thank you. Brief it is. Oh man, the legal eagles are now all scrambling to try to figure out how to counter what Eastman just got done saying. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to committee substitute for House Bill 291, State Affairs, thus adopting Senate committee substitute for committee substitute for House Bill 291, Finance, and recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? Brief it is. All right, sorry about the music there, folks. Uh, I've just about got my nightly chores done to where I will not be walking away from the computer again, and I can concentrate more on what they got going on there. Uh, it's uh, the bad part about being delayed in time for what they are actually go doing there in Juno, and they all of a sudden stop talking and put at ease while they discuss things. Eastman brought up a good point. They cannot have two conference committees within one bill. It goes against the statutes and laws that they have. But 
as we've always seen in the past, these are law breakers, not law makers. They fail to follow the laws that they themselves have written or have had written in the past by previous legislators. And they expect to just rubber stamp whatever the agenda is of those who are in power want it to be. Which has been made very clear over the last past week and a half and in the subcommittee that uh, was created of the House and the Senate members that consolidated the state capital, mental health, uh, supplemental, PFD, CBR budget that they had created. And the only thing that the majority had uh, taken out of that, those few six that was in the room, was our PFD. That is pretty much the only cut that they made. They left all the illegal funding into it for K through 12 forward funding. That $1.2 billion that when it goes in front of the court system will be stripped back out again. But they intentionally did this. They even openly admitted when they were discussing SB 199, that 75-25 PFD split that uh, received such opposition that was presented by the Senate Finance Committee, only heard in the Senate Finance Committee, created and crafted by the Senate Finance Committee that literally died on the House floor and got sent back to, or on the Senate floor and was sent back to the Rules Committee. This is no different than all of the back room door shenanigans that they have done since day one. This is the commission that they're talking about right now that gave us the horrible, god-awful laws for SB 191. Oh, there goes the gavel again. Please come back to order. Brief it ease. Well, that didn't take them very long. Uh, are they going to bring a point of order like Eastman has asked for? Are they going to look at the statutes and laws and actually follow them and concur whether or not what he said is valid and that this bill needs to be completely squashed where it sits and should no longer be being heard, that nobody should be allowed to vote on this, that uh, it is breaking our laws as it is written? Or will they just do like they've done in the past and demand a vote to happen on it right here and now? To concur this bill which in all honesty it does not deserve to pass I don't want more disastrous SB 191 laws come back to order is there further discussion on committee substitute for House Bill 291 Representative McCarty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm looking at my copy, and I know that you know that the, I only have the odd pages like many others. But on the end of it, page 17, line 12, says section 22, referring to section 4 of the section takes effect July 1st, 2029. And I don't know what's taken effect uh, quite a while from now. So if someone could address that, I'd appreciate it. Brief it is. Man, that did not take them long again. Back at ease all over again. Uh, it's like, come on, guys. Let's get your act together. Let's figure out what you're going to do. So again, the one good thing that did come out of today's uh, in the House was that the Reeds Act has finally passed after three years. Will the House please come back to order? Representative Clayman. Are you able to respond to? Yes. The, thank you, Madam Speaker. The question raised by the member from Eagle, from Eagle River, the provisions that he references on page 17 is specific to their certain data and data collection functions that, that preceded any of these 
collections going on. And what that provides is that at the sunset of this data analysis commission, if the legislature chooses not to extend the commission at that point in time, then the data that is that is being collected will be collected by the Judicial Council rather than by the Data Analysis Commission. So those are provisions that allow continued collection of data after the sunset of this commission. Further comments? Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to committee substitute for House Bill 291, State Affairs, thus adopting Senate committee substitute for committee substitute for House Bill 291, Finance, and recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the House concur in the Senate changes to committee substitute for House Bill 291? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 21 yeas, 18 nays. With 21 yeas and 18 nays, committee substitute for House Bill 291 has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the effective date clause. Are you ready for the question? <clears throat> the question is, shall the effective date clause Pass the House. Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 25 yeas, 14 nays. With 25 yeas and 14 nays, the effective date has passed the House. Oh, 27. With 25 yeas and 14 nays, the effective date has failed to pass the House. <coughs> Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that Senate concurrent resolution 28, the title change resolution for House Bill 291 be taken up as a special order of business. Without objection, are you ready for the question? Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaking to the title change, um, as was mentioned previously, this does add another uh, border commission to the title. Uh, more than that, it, it more than doubles the length of the title that we sent over to the other body. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready for the question? Question is, shall Senate concurrent resolution 28 pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce a vote? 23 yeas, 16 nays. With 23 yeas and 16 nays, Senate Concurrent Resolution 28 has failed to pass the House. Brief at ease. All right, at ease again. I cannot believe that that actually passed the House, um, but then they have concurrent failed votes directly after that. So it really makes me wonder what the mindset of these legislators are there in Juneau and what their actually game plan is through all of this. Uh, if you are not aware, a little update, you can watch this live on politidic.com and click the live link there and you can watch any video that we are live streaming at the time. You can watch it on the website if you prefer to use your web browser to do this and you're not one that likes to watch things on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. 
and uh, so we have given you another option to be able to watch us while we are live you can always replay any of our live streams at YouTube Facebook or Twitter they are always available and we are working to where soon as we do our videos as soon as they are uploaded and completed we will be adding them onto the website so that way you can find all the latest and greatest videos that we have streamed elsewhere and always have a direct link there that is something that I have been working on actively in the background here to try to accomplish and being a one-person show it takes me a little bit longer to accomplish some of my goals than I would like but it's still plugging away on a daily basis so I'm still curious are they ever going to get to the actual bill that we are all here to be watching in the first place which is uh, HB 281 282 and get to find out exactly where that budget is going to happen at and uh, for the first time ever I just actually went to the website and clicked on the live link to see how well it was working other than my one test I had done when I had set it up I've never actually gone there to view it while it was live and uh, so I just did here just a second ago it's kinda cool to actually be able to watch a video on the website there and and know that it's working that uh, I learned something new it's it's a you're never too old to learn something new old dogs can learn new tricks so today not much has been going on here in the house that I would consider positive yet that has gone through other than the Reeds Act bill that they passed about the only positive thing I've seen this evening since I've been streaming there has been lots and lots and lots of bills that have been pushed through both the Senate and the House here the last couple of days on the floors and they are just passing them like it's water passing through a stream and going over the top of the waterfall you can't keep up with the numbers or the amount of bills that they have passed or that the governor is going to have to be signing for the end of this year are rejecting and vetoing of the bills the last one that just passed here in the house was HB 291 and it took two committees in one bill which goes as Eastman had pointed out against our actual statutes and laws for being able to do something like that but they did it anyways which just goes to emphasize the point that I have been saying for five long years that I have been actually reporting out there into the real world that our legislators down there in Juneau are no longer lawmakers they are guaranteed law breakers and that is that they don't hesitate to break the law when it matches their agenda but they'll won't follow the law uh, to, to, to save a, a dead dying person on the side of the road they, they won't follow the law to help that person if it means that it goes against the special interest agenda and the marching orders that they have been given down there in Juneau. So what is going on in the House right now? They're still working on the APOC report, uh, referendum, recall, contra contributions. They're on amendment number four. This all has to do with campaign contributions and reporting. <clears throat> is trying their, their, it's their attempt to try to give a little bit of accountability to uh, ballot measure number two uh, that, that they claimed was all about dark money that gave us the new jungle primaries and the ranked choice voting general elections and uh, I, all I and hearing who the opposition is about some of the reforms that this bill is going to accomplish it's coming from those who pushed that ballot measure onto all of us uh, uh, under the disguise of getting rid of dark money and it did nothing of the sorts in fact all it did was just re-emphasize the same reporting methods that they already had in place stating that all legislators got to through their personal campaigns that they run have to report every penny from every contributor no matter where it came from so that there is no such thing as what they classified as dark money but if I don't work for that campaign and I am running an outside group independent of that campaign I can collect all the dark money that I want to run smear ads and everything else and I don't have to report a single penny
because I don't work for any of the campaigns out there. So technically right at this point, I mean, if you're an Alaska legislator and you wanted me to run a campaign for you, a shadow campaign out there, you just go tell your donors to go, hey, go show your support to Politic out there. Go make a whole bunch of, uh, uh, click on his support page and make some donations and let's give him a whole bunch of money and let's ask him to run a smear campaign against whatever legislator we want to bury underneath all of the trivia information that usually has no basis in reality that most smear campaigns do. I mean, we can't forget the bear doctor and, and his little monstrosity that was working out there to defend him. And same thing with a good old uh, Alaska's AOC, Elise Galvin. And uh, But uh, I, I don't mean to insult uh, AOC like that. Uh, I know that uh, AOC has just slightly more brains than our Elise Galvin does, at least from what I've seen of her campaigns over the last few years. It's just nothing more than the far left tactics that have been used throughout our national elections throughout the United States. All right, they're back. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the limbo file to take up Senate Bill 131. The member from District 17 will remind us of the amendments adopted by the House. Well, <laughs> Representative Josephson. Uh, yes, the the other body, um, the, other, the other body uh, rejected our amendments, uh, and they want a bill that covers breast cancer as a presumptive illness. Um, I believe I believe that there's a settlement and a quick one to be had. I know Representative it, yes. Josephson, if you could just remind us of the changes the House made. Sure, the House um, <laughs> the House added a number of cancers that that facts suggested firefighters could get on the job, and the House also added permanent partial impairment um, uh, updates to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House recede from its amendments to Senate Bill 131, titled amended, and recommend that the members vote no. I'd like to call has been placed. I'll take a brief at ease. Another at ease, another at ease. I mean, I don't understand a lot of this stuff. They really do need to get there. In my opinion, this is just... Uh, a bunch of political games they continue to play so that they can confer with each other in the background to try to decide what they want to do over and over and over again. Just like when they all disappear out of the room to go talk in back rooms, uh, boiler rooms I like to call them, out of the, the limelight of the cameras to where nobody can hear what they're doing so that way you don't get to know what kind of blackmail, coercion, or thinly veiled threats are being thrown in their directions to coerce them into following the agenda that they want to have in play. Either you toe the line or don't, uh, those kind of things in the back rooms, or what can we give you to get you to vote this way? Kind of like, I, I'll put it simply, I, I know for a fact that Kirka voted no for the budget that last time and he claims that it was because of the abortion funding in it and uh, but if you go and look at his for governor campaign page is he has an entire section dedicated to standing tall as the governor always put it for protecting our permanent fund dividend but when he actually gets the chance as a legislator he didn't do it so where do we stand when he actually wants to try to become our governor? If he wouldn't do it when it counted the most there on the floor, he could have been that 19th vote instead of the 22nd vote that got it to not happen and, and sh destroyed any chances Alaskans had of seeing a statutory PFD. 
and it's just a lot of grandstanding going on. Well, I have, I have it on good authority, and it kind of, I think it was expressed during the third special committee, committee meeting that was held two days ago, or yesterday, the very last one, the third one. And uh, they were talking about the abortion funding inside of there and how certain legislators wanted to make sure that that abortion funding was restripped back out of the budget and that entire discussion if you go along with what was being said on the house floor that particular day when that vote came and the, the two people two legislators that we thought for sure would vote yes because they ran on the statutory pft and made promises that if it ever made it into the budget they would be a guaranteed yes and when the time the rubber hit the road and the time came them and several other legislators out there all the the exact same time all voted no and so the way i look at it all 22 of those legislators that voted no to concur on the budget for the from the senate every single one of them that needs to be serious to look at replacing this next election or could that, you you suggested that we not recede. Could you explain what the difference is between receding and not receding to this body, please? Sure. Um, Quickly. Yes. Receding is giving up the fight. It's saying Senate will take, other body will take your bill as you sent it to us. Not receding is saying, hey, let's have a 15-minute powwow and cut a deal. That's the difference. Okay, Representative Eastman. Thank, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and, and in substance, I think the previous speaker was right. What, what the significance of this vote means is, will we adopt and pass into law if we vote to receive, which is a yes vote? And then that would adopt version A.A .A of the bill, which is in your packet at the very back of, of the section for this bill. Um, were we to vote no with the red button, that's effectively saying we want a conference committee to sort out the, the differences. So um, I will be making a yes vote, which would adopt the original version of the bill, which the Senate has insisted on. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready? Oh, are you ready for the question? Question is, shall the House recede from its amendment to Senate Bill 131? Members may proceed to vote. <coughs> Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 17 yeas, 22 nays. With 17 yeas and 22 nays, the House has failed to recede. And I am naming a conference committee. And that conference committee will be Representative Josephson, Representative Wool, and Representative Carpenter. And the, carp and the chair will be Representative Josephson. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move and ask unanimous consent that the members go into the limbo file to take up House Bill 163. The member from District 25 will explain the changes made in the other body. While everyone finds House Bill 163, I'll jump right in. Uh, we've got another shotgun wedding here in the final hours. Uh, I'm very happy to announce that uh, the member from District 8 and I have been uh, newly wed, and his bill has been inserted into mine. Uh, I'll let him cover any of the, the changes or details there that he might want to cover. The only other change I'd outline is that uh, there was an amendment in, this, in the other body to 
uh, clarify existing statute with regards to the renewal of driver's license. Uh, the DMV has taken a uh, odd, odd interpretation of statute that uh, Ledge Legal has said is pretty clear and contrary to their interpretation where if you renew your driver's license early, uh, you renew it for an entire year or less than you would otherwise be able to renew it for, therefore uh, making that renewal have to take place more frequently. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things over to the member from District 8 in case there's anything he wants to highlight there. Thank you, Representative McCabe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. HB 166 is uh, what the uh, member from District 25 is talking about. It's a single license plate per vehicle. Pass this body 29 to 10. I know that you all probably remember it, so I won't go too deep into it. The only change that the Senate made, um, there, I'm sorry, that the other body made, there happens to be a truck driver over there, commercial truck driver, and he saw it as a, a way to change what uh, DOT and he think was a problem, or he thought was a problem, and put on a commercial vehicle the tractors that enter the scales, put the license plate on those vehicles on the front so that as they enter the scales and the um, inspection station, the people in the window can actually see the tab and see the license plate. I thought it was a great change. The DOT thought it was great. And that's the only uh, the only change they made. So um, with that, thank you. Thank you, Representative Eastman. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. In uh, two minutes or less, I'll do my best. Um, I did consult with some law enforcement members. I know um, after this bill passed, and um, I have yet to find a member of law enforcement in this state who supports this bill. Um, it did not come to us at the request of law enforcement. Um, it did not come to us at the request of individuals who are, are being pulled over for having one license plate, which we heard there are very few, if any. Um, I know there are concerns in this state and other states uh, from those who own high-end uh, vehicles, um, and they have concerns over their high-end vehicles and putting front license plates on them. Um, one of the things that came out as I was talking with law enforcement is that when we have amber alerts or when we have uh, bank robberies or when we're looking for vehicles um, and trying to find out where a vehicle went, um, the traffic cameras all focus on your front license plate. Now, it'd be nice if we have traffic cameras that focus on the back, but I guess if there's a truck in the way, that doesn't work either. That's just the way it is. Um, you lose the ability to find out where a particular vehicle went uh, in a hurry. We had this debate once before. We just um, just concurring to the changes. This is all being added to this bill. That's why I'm speaking to it. Thank you. Continue, Representative uh, Eastman. Thank you, Master. And I'll do my best to, to wrap up. Um, I understand that there are um, there are some who, who think this would be a good idea. Um, I haven't found any in law enforcement that do. Uh, it does not match my experience. Um, you know, when I've been involved in, in traffic stops and so forth, Having the ability to identify vehicles, just as was, was mentioned with the vehicle um, amendment that was just adopted in the Senate, there are instances where a front plate absolutely helps. And uh, for law enforcement, for trying to find out where vehicles went in a hurry, it's absolutely um, something that we should keep. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Fields. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. The Anchorage Police Department Employees Association, um, the union of police officers expressed their um, concerns in opposition to removing a front license plate requirement. So just a reminder about that, and that explains my no vote on concurrence. Thanks to you. Thank you. Representative Hannon. Thank you, and I'm hoping that uh, the representative from Big Lake, uh, because of the part about non-commercial or commercial vehicles now having front plate, the example he gave was a commercial truck going into a way station, but I don't see that distinguished, and I'm curious of the statute, is it only large commercial trucks, or is it all commercial vehicles, i.e., um, a, a, a contractor truck that has a license as a commercial vehicle to transport trash? Is it uh, taxis? Is it all of those commercial vehicles, or is it only large commercial trucks going to way stations? Thank you. Representative McCabe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You just want me to answer the question? Yes, please. It's just for large commercial vehicles that would be subject to the um, uh, scales and the inspection. And I believe that's in statute, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Majority Leader. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House Bill 163, thus adopting House Bill 163 amended Senate and effective date added Senate and recommend that the members vote yes. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the House concur in Senate changes to House Bill 163? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 29 yeas, 10 nays. With 29 yeas and 10 nays, committee substitute for 163 has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the vote on the passage of the bill be considered the vote on the effective date clause. Hearing no objection, the effective date clause has been adopted. <coughs> Brief ease. Oh, sorry about that there. I was listening to the Senate, and they're still discussing the APOC reporting over there. They're working through that bill. They're working extremely hard to get some sort of election reform being passed through the Senate and the House this year. They're getting ready for this upcoming elections that are about ready to happen. I'm sure many of you out there are like me received their ballot in the mail and they opened it up and saw those 48 names on there and went holy crap who do i pick from that list oh man i have been working rapidly or trying to anyways and uh, i've been burning up time here tonight that i should have been working on it just <laughs> kind of like my work schedule during the day it's, it's left me no personal time to do other things but uh, I have been working on a video. I think you guys will all enjoy it. Uh, I had been showing some folks around out here the short clip that I've already put together for it. It is coming together nicely. I'm learning a lot of video, video editing skills. And I hope you guys like the video as much as I do. I finally get to use the MD that I have behind my name that I've had behind my name for 20 years now. And uh, so I can use my MD to help everybody with this new and upcoming election cycle. And maybe to let you guys all know exactly what you're suffering from. House, please come back to order. Mr. Majority Leader. Brief uh, Brief Well, that didn't take them long to get at another at ease. Oh, there they go. The Senate Concurrent Resolution 30, the title change resolution for House Bill 163, be taken up as a special order of business. Are you ready for the question? Okay. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to remind that uh, we did send over a very short title that was very concise, and we're coming back with a title that's four times longer from the other body. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall... <laughs> Senate Concurrent Resolution 30 pass the House. Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 36 yeas, 2 nays. With 36 yeas and 2 nays, Senate Concurrent Resolution 30 
has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Brief it is. Wow, very impressive. McCabe, after two years of being there, gets his very first bill to actually pass. Uh, so it, it, it's amazing to hear after two years of being there, one of the bills that he brought forward and, and was the main sponsor at the very beginning of it finally makes its way through. And what makes this even more amazing is it actually saves our state money. Wow, man, something that actually cuts the expenses. Oh, they're back. This time I'm going to roll Senate Bill 151 and Senate Bill 182 to the bottom of the calendar, and we will address Senate Bill 219. Madam Clerk. Get your paperwork in order before you start rolling bills into the back and, and bringing other bills forward. Why are you rolling bills to the back? I mean, we are running out of time. It is 10, 11 at night, and they have still yet to pass a budget. And that's exactly the same way it's going on over there in the Senate at the moment. They have literally an hour and 53 minutes to go going by the clock that I see on the screen there from them not what the actual time is thanks to tape delays and uh, so they, they literally at this point are running out of time they got one hour and 52 minutes that and neither the House nor the Senate has brought forward any of the state and capital budget supplemental budget CBR vote None of that has been brought to the floors on either body to be voted on, and they are literally running out of time. So it's, it's really curious. I, I, I think the number one reason that they're doing this right now is so that they don't have to have legislators standing up on their soapboxes, declaring their little speeches and statements about why they can't vote for this budget or why they shouldn't. And uh, oh, she just demanded they all sit down Senator again. Michicki, entitled an act providing for the transfer of and addition of names to a personal use cabin permit for a cabin on state land and providing for an effective date. The Resources Committee considered the bill, attached one previously published zero fiscal note, signing the report due pass, Representative McKay. No recommendation, Fields, Hannon, Shragi, and Chair Puckatuck. I have no House Committee substitutes. Madam Clerk, do you have any amendments? Amendment number one by Representatives Cronk and Puckatuck, beginning page three, line four. Representative Cronk. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move amendment one. There's been an objection. Representative Cronk. Uh, amendment one, all it does is it uh, backs up the, the retro date five years. Um, right now it's 2020, and um, we thought it would be a good thing to go back three more years before to give a little bit of time for anybody that uh, has missed. Is there further discussion? In wrap up, Representative Cronk. Vote yes. Are you ready for the question? Brief it is. Okay, back at ease again. I mean, it does not take them long to swing that gavel. Anyways, uh, so yeah, no, we're, we're sitting here. We got less than uh, two hours. We got an hour and 50 minutes. Neither the Senate nor the House has heard the budget bills that we've been all waiting, chomping at the bit to see how they vote. At least that's the main reason why I'm watching. Oh, back. Are you ready for the question? Question is: Shall Amendment Number One to House Bill or to Senate Bill Two Nineteen pass the House? Members may proceed to vote. <coughs> Will
Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 38 yeas, zero nays. With 38 yeas and zero nays, amendment number one to Senate Bill 219 has passed the House. Madam Clerk. Amendment number two will not be offered. Madam Clerk. Amendment number 3A with the work order I.2, beginning on page one, line one, by Representatives Vance and Rauscher. Representative Vance. I will not be offering amendment number two. Madam Clerk. Amendment number 3B, identified with work order I.3, by Representative Prox, beginning page one, line one. Representative Prox. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, move amendment number 3B. There's been an objection. Representative Prox. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is uh, just a simple policy move that we can make that will provide an additional tool in the state's regulatory toolbox to incentivize and grow oil and gas production and does so at a pivotal time as the world needs more Alaska oil and gas. And for further details, I will let the representative um, from District 40 fill us in on that. Representative Pocketuck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To give some context, speaking in support of uh, the amendment, what it does is it rolls House Bill 81, which is the net profit share lease agreement bill that passed out of this body, 37-0, May 14th, 2021. Current status is in Senate Finance Committee with its companion bill, Senate Bill 61. Um, as the representative who sponsored the amendment spoke to, simple, simple policy move. Um, I'd like to remind members of the body that we uh, adopted an amendment on the floor, putting an additional check and balance on the process uh, that allowed oversight from the Alaska Royalty Oil and Gas Development Advisory Board. Um, and so, as the policy change, what it does is allows the net profit share lease agreements to be taken into consideration for modification as the same as existing for royalty leases. Um, and I would like to remind members of the body that uh, the process cannot be undertook unless a uh, net profit share lease agreement is found to be economically unfeasible. And I would urge members uh, redundant support of the marriage of HB 81 into the honorable uh, president of the other bodies, uh, Bill 219. Brief, Chris. celebration time they are finally going to bring the bill to the floor 281 further debate representative prox and wrap up i encourage everyone to adopt this change this amendment thank you are you ready for the question question is shall amendment number three b to senate Bill 219, pass the House. Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 39 yeas, zero nays. With 39 yeas and zero nays, amendment number 3B has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, because it's getting late in the hour. I move to table Senate Bill 
219 to be taken up later so we can get to House Bill 281, the appropriations and operation budget. Uh, budget. There's been an objection. Representative Eastman, would you like to speak to your objection? Um, no. Oh, that's right. The question, is, the question is, shall Senate Bill 280, I thought it was 219. Shall Senate Bill 219 be tabled? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 22 yeas, 17 nays. With 22 yeas and 17 nays, Senate Bill 219 has been tabled. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that it be the sense of the House that the draw from the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund in the Conference Committee report for House Bill 281 should be approved. There's been an objection. Madam Speaker. Mr. Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that we table the sense of the House so we can take up House Bill 281, the operating budget loans and funds. There's been an objection. The question is, Tabling the sense of the House. Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 35 yeas, 4 nays. With 35 yeas and 4 nays, the sense of the House has been tabled and 281 will be taken up. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that the House take up the conference committee report for House Bill 281, which is in the limbo file or actually probably in, on the member's desk. And the member from District 14 will explain the report. Representative Merrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am pleased to offer the body the committee conference committee report for House Bill 281, the operating and capital budget. This budget was a collaborative effort between the minorities and majorities in both bodies. We were tasked with completing two weeks worth of work and negotiations in three days. But when you put a woman in charge, it gets done. There were very late nights and very early mornings, and the result is a budget that will have a positive impact in the lives of all of the people of our state. HB 281 sets the permanent fund dividend at an amount equal to 50% of the POMV draw, approximately $2,550 per eligible Alaskan. It also includes an energy relief payment of $1,300. The combined $3,850 will help Alaskans recover coming out of the pandemic and help combat high fuel costs. This budget protects Alaskans by adding seven trooper positions, primarily in rural areas as well as providing pay raises for our VPSOs. We're providing increased salaries and bonuses for prosecutors and public defenders. This will help reduce the backlog of over 20,000 pending cases. There is also funding for the Civil Air Patrol and search and rescue services. This budget puts Alaskans to work by funding the largest capital budget in nearly a decade. The projects span our entire state. We're investing nearly $7 million in the people of Alaska by providing workforce development to ensure Alaskans have the skills necessary to fill the jobs to keep our economy moving. HB 281 also funds individual training accounts, construction academies, competitive grants, and VOTEC training. This budget strongly supports education by appropriating $57 million outside the formula as well as taking care of residential schools since they fall outside of the formula. Our young Alaskans will be better prepared for kindergarten by supplying two and a half million dollars in pre-K grants. With the passage of HB 
322, pardon me, 322, the Higher Education Fund will receive $395 million to provide scholarships to our best and brightest students. And not only are we funding school bond debt reimbursement and REAA at the full amounts, we also make them whole. From previous years of vetoes and re reductions in funding, this will help alleviate the tax burden at the local level on our friends and constituents. Lastly, we give our school district stability by providing forward funding of education by over $750 million. This budget encourages resource development in our state by funding up to $349 million in oil and gas tax credits. It provides $2.5 million for statehood defense, and while the assumption of 404 primacy was rejected, $1 million was included for a feasibility study to be completed by February 2023. This budget supports our university system. It increases funding for fixed costs across campuses funds research and development projects, as well as $50 million in much needed deferred maintenance. And finally, Madam Speaker, this budget protects Alaska's future by putting money into savings, both the corpus of the permanent fund and the statutory budget reserve. Madam Speaker, our most important job is to pass a balanced budget. So on this final night of the 32nd Alaska Legislature, it is fitting that we can approve House Bill 281 a budget that will positively impact the lives of our families, friends, neighbors, and constituents. I encourage it, I, pardon me, I encourage an enthusiastic yes vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As I see the um, uh, previous speaker was able to extend her remarks, I, I move and ask unanimous consent that due to the importance of this bill, we waive the time limits during the debate uh, on this bill as it does clock in at over 200 pages. Two minutes might not be enough to appropriately deal with that. There's been an objection. Are you ready for brief it is? Force the vote. Force the vote. I want to hear from every single legislator. Their time should not be restrained. They shouldn't be limited to just two minutes. We have more than enough time to hear this. We got an hour and a half. Let's give them all whatever it'll take and up to the point of the vote. Will the House please come back to order? The question is whether or not to remove the two-minute time limit in the debate. Members may proceed to vote. Will clerk please lock the roll. Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? Four yeas, 34 nays. With four yeas and 34 nays, the time limit will remain at two Cowards. minutes for debate. Is there further debate? Representative Kirka. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll be voting, I'll keep it short, I'll be voting no on this budget for three reasons. It's the biggest budget in state history. Uh, I pledge to my constituents that I'll be fighting or opposing uh, giant budgets. And it still funds abortions. The uh, pro-life language we have passed out of the House was not put back in. And we're still not funding a full statutory dividend. So I'll be voting no for those reasons. Thank you. Is there further debate? Seeing no further debate, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House adopt the conference committee with limited powers of the free conference report, thus adopting conference committee substitute for House Bill 281. Brief it is.
Holy crap. Did you guys just see what just happened there? I, I'm just... I, I'm floored. I'm absolutely floored. So the only person that has spoke up here when HB 281 came to the floor was Kirka. Kirka's the only one that had enough cojones to actually stand up and say something. Still doesn't make me approve of what he did because his vote and Eastman who's standing there, their votes are the reason why it went to this freaking conference committee in the first place. I'm sure that I'm, I, I almost could bet my bottom dollar on it that if they would have voted yes, they would have found that one more vote that was needed to make it 21 to 19 and made it so that the Senate's bill would have been passed. Kirk pointed it out very well there, and uh, that, you know, other than the abortion funding, which he darn well knows our government will have to put right back into the budget again, because our state laws don't allow for, uh, that it's been fought time and time again, and we've lost every single time the court system puts that money right back in again. But and, but I do agree it, we shouldn't be paying for it at all. I, I morally I am completely against it, but that does not make me look at forget to look at the greater good and look at reality of what it has a chance and what he dang well knows will never have it flying chance no no prayer no how, and uh, so here we are we we just hear them open up HB 281 the only person to speak up and say what they wanted to say was uh, Kirka there was an, almost a unanimous vote there was 34 legislators there that all voted to not extend the two-minute time limit for any speech that is given on the floor and not a single legislator put their microphone up to speak about the current largest in history budget that has ever been spent in the state of Alaska. Something that I have been saying since day one, if you remove our permanent fund dividend out of this and that phony let me try to buy your vote energy rebate check that they claim they're giving us um, that is nothing more than a bribe that should be them paying us back or paying us our statutory PFD instead. Uh, there, there's no excuse for this. Every single legislator that did not stand up today, I mean, uh, in, uh, in a lot of ways, Kirka just you know, I gained a little bit more respect for him than I've had for him for the last couple of days since he voted no on the original Senate's budget there for concurrence. Um, I still have a long way before I'd ever forgive him, but if we don't see someone else stand up and speak here, there there's 40 people inside of that room that need to be voted out. House, please come back to order. Representative Merrick in wrap-up. Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I uh, didn't want to let an opportunity to speak to the budget go by. <laughs> you know, two minutes probably isn't enough time to be able to trace from start to finish the shell game that uh, the legislature has played uh, with where the money's going, how much, where it's being divided, what account it's going into, and then into another account, and then into a third account. So I, I can't do that in two minutes. What I can do is I can explain just one portion of, of the budget, uh, and that is the uh, 11 union contracts which are in the budget. Now, you may not see them because they only appear as a line item. Um, they actually are some 200 pages um, or more, and that's just the four that we were actually able to get a copy of. Um, the other seven, I'm still waiting for a copy of. Uh, no one seems to be able to find it. And the copies that I do have, uh, some are not digital. Uh, you're not able to search them and find out uh, keyword searches and those sorts of things because um, for some reason there's no digital copy to be had. And I was only able to get a, a black and white paper copy. Now some of those um, uh, union contracts are, are quite extensive. Um, some of them have 4% you know, wage increases starting here next month, 5% uh, 
um, various degrees of, of conditional language. We have, um, for the first time in some of these contracts, we're inserting uh, requirements based on sexual orientation, based on gender identity. Uh, none of this has been debated. We're about to be voting to approve these contracts. And, and it's surprising, I think, that when my office asked for the contracts, some of the answers that we got were, well, nobody's ever asked for that. We don't know where that is. Um, and that speaks to just the inability for us as members of this body to actually know what we're voting on. The budget here itself is over 200 pages. The contracts are more than that just in the contracts that I have. And I don't know how long the other ones are because I can't find copies of them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I see that my time has expired. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Eastman. Is there further discussion? In wrap-up, Representative Merrick. Madam Speaker, thank you. I just hope that my 39 colleagues on this floor tonight are as proud to vote for House Bill 281 as I am. Thank you. Thank you. Brief it is. All right, is anybody else's stomachs literally just came out of their mouths and they're, they're, they're at this moment in time just as floored as I am what just happened here in the house and I, I know I'm just I'm floored by this I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm literally speechless and, and anybody that follows me long enough knows that it's hard to leave me speechless. Um, wow. Please help me. Uh, so two people are the only people, Kirka and Eastman, the two that in my mind tanked the the budget from passing and, and I, I'll still blame them because I would have been more happier with it failing with a 20 to 20 vote than the those two voting no for it um, a after all the promises that they have made years after year about the PFD and uh, knowing full well that what was going to happen did happen and we see it here in the room the only hope that is left is that the majority vote no for the budget and y you all know as well as I do and you, you can see the handwriting on the wall that they are not going to vote no on the budget. Uh, the, the only second portion that they can vote no on is the CBR vote and uh, that they do have enough in the minority to where they can force the CBR not to pass and uh, I know that they don't want that to happen there. They, they want the CBR vote to pass and uh, but whether or not that's going to happen it's it's hard to say but that does contingent on whether or not we see the other half of the energy rebate that's how they're trying to buy us alaskan silence for the votes um and then uh but uh they they put a lot of the pork that goes to the red districts that would normally be voting no in that room and it's kind of their way of blackmailing and coercing them into giving that yes vote, that final vote for the CBR, which they need a supermajority in there to release that money. And uh, so the combination of here, we're going to affect your constituents' pocketbooks with half of the money that we were going to give them. And uh, we're going to stick some of the pork projects that affected those red districts like out in the Matsu because you guys just don't play along nicely and you don't follow our rules. And when we put the agenda out there, you buck the system every step of the way. So we're, we're now down basically to final remarks or if there is going to be anybody else in that room brave enough actually to stand up and speak out uh, against this abhorrent, horrible, largest budget in Alaska state history, and that in, is including if you were to remove our PFD, 
remove the stimulus check back out of this budget, it is still the biggest we've ever had in history. Will the House please come back to order? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House adopt the conference committee with limited powers of free conference report, thus adopting conference committee substitute for House Bill 281. Are you ready for the question? Question is, shall the House adopt the conference committee report for House Bill 281? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Representative Johnson. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any other member wish to change your vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 33 yeas, 7 nays. 33 yeas and 7 nays. Conference committee report, House Bill 281 has passed the House. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move and ask unanimous consent that we table House Bill 281 so we can go back to Senate Bill 219, Madam Speaker. There's been an objection. Brief it is. Did you guys see that vote? I mean, literally, did you just see that vote? Um, I, I'm, oh my gosh, I just, I can't believe our legislators in Juneau, they, they just confirmed exactly what we all know since day one. Um, there is only seven names there that deserve a pat on the back for their votes. And all the other 33 legislators that voted yes to adopt House Bill 281, uh, they are all up. Every single one of those people are up for re-election this year. And uh, they better hope that they don't have a better candidate running against them right now, especially if they're in the conservative area, if, if they call even consider themselves that anymore after this vote. Uh, I am just absolutely floored but what by what I see there in green uh, I, I I'm still just speechless here uh, and I'm pretty sure the rest of my fellow Alaskans out there are in the same shape at this moment in time just with their mouths open wide going holy crap what the hell is this um, I uh, just popping into the Senate's there real quick to see if they they were doing anything else. They're still hearing HB 349 hearing established drilling units. So we just had the the vote on the floor for HB 281, and the these corrupt lawbreakers are celebrating the largest budget in Alaska's history excluding the PFD and the stimulus check take that completely out of this budget this is still the largest budget that has ever been passed in Alaska's history if you include the PF uh, still leave exclude the PFD and the stimulus check they're going to give us they're spending 29 billion dollars this year 19 billions going out the door of that my motion madam speaker i move and ask unanimous consent 
<laughs> no, I can't do that, but I would like to do that. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I move that the appropriations from the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund, Fund, Article 9, Section 17C of the Constitution of the State of Alaska be adopted. Yeah. Is everybody here? Brief it is. So what I was just saying there before they regaveled back in, they have $19 billion when you add in all the federal money they have to spend. They, they still had a few billion dollars left over of the COVID relief. Then they had the big infrastructure that came in through the door. That was another roughly uh, $10 billion in that direction with another $9 billion that's slated to be in for next year's budget. That's where the $29 billion total came from. But uh, then you add in what they are spending here for this. This is $9 billion here. So they're spending $19 billion before they even pay us our stimulus check. And, uh, and uh, not our, but that's including our stimulus check and the PFD when you include the $9 billion that they're spending today. And uh, that's a pretty outrageous budget considering that it's all going to special interest. I mean, the K through 12 normal budget is $1.34 billion was what it was last year. And they just gave them $3.5 billion. This is on top of the University of Alaska got another almost $500 million handed to them for the grant and uh, student loan program that only requires about $70 million a year to fund. And uh, then you've got the $300 million in tax credits that was given back to the oil companies, which they need to pay off anyway. So, but uh, I'm wondering, you know, oil companies are more important than following the law to pay Alaskans back their money. And our laws have been on for that, have been on the books longer than their laws. And uh, so you could just keep going right on up and down the line there. Oh, they gaveled in. Will the House please come to order? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the appropriations in Section 86 from the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund, Article 9, Section 17C of the Constitution of the State of Alaska be adopted. Okay. There's been an objection, Representative Eastman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, I think this provision, perhaps more than any other aspect of the budget, um, deals with that uh, shell game that I was referring to earlier. And you'll find in Section 84 of the bill the um, one-time payment uh, as part of the permanent fund dividend. Um, and that's, that's important for a number of different reasons. But uh, one of the reasons is because when something is part of the permanent fund dividend, it also triggers expenditures on behalf of, of the state for the whole harmless provision elsewhere in statute. Uh, and so if something is in the dividend, then it triggers those requirements and those expenditures. If something is not in the dividend, then it does not, uh, and the state spends less money. But um, the $1,300 is, is found in Section 84. Half of that is being appropriated by this vote. Um, it is my contention, uh, and I hope I'm not the only one, that this is the money that uh, effectively originated a while back. You have to go upstream a ways in the earnings reserve account. Uh, you move running from the earnings reserve account. You move it through some other accounts. Now we're, we're dealing with it now. And one of the ways that this happens is through the constitutional budget reverse uh, reserve sweep, which is not uh, taking place in this uh, particular bill. Uh, the scoop, which is also not taking place in this particular bill, which is having the effect of since we are not following these statutes and these provisions of the Constitution as intended, uh, it is moving and keeping from moving various funds from various places. So now here we are, we're about to vote on whether or not to pay this portion of the funds uh, as stated in the bill as part of the permanent fund dividend. Uh, certainly uh, my district and myself uh, desire that to happen. However, it should be noted, 
it would have been much better and I think more transparent for the public if we didn't have to go through the shell game every year, especially this year. It's especially creative. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Kirka. I'll say it shorter, Madam Speaker. This is outrageous. The uh, law is very clear. The dividend is supposed to come from the earnings reserve account. And leveraging uh, the process like this is bad process. Um, instead of pulling out things out of the CBR that are less popular to try to do the dividend like this is, a, is outrageous. Thank you. Representative McCabe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, it's only a shell game if you don't understand it, I guess. Um, and there are many parts of this budget that I don't understand. I don't understand where the money came from and that sort of stuff. But let's be clear. As I said uh, a couple weeks ago when we were discussing this budget on the floor, the $1,300, as was designated by this body, is not a PFD for very specific reasons. It's called an energy relief fund. So to characterize it or mischaracterize it is a better word as a PFD is is wrong. So One maybe more, Representative Eastman. Point of order, Madam Speaker. We have a rule against impugning the motives. Uh, no one here is mischaracterizing anything because that would require them to have motives to intentionally mischaracterize something, which they are not. Point well Keep taken, Ms. Representative Eastman. Representative McCabe, continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, as I said, the energy relief money that the House passed a month and a half or two months ago um, is not part of the PFD. I know it got lumped in when we were discussing a full PFD and we were discussing the total amount, but I was very clear about that when I, when I made this uh, statement on the floor weeks ago, two weeks ago, ten days ago, and I'm very clear about it now. It's not a shell game to me. It's actually separate from the PFD. So in this case, the Finance uh, Conference Committee has paid us a 50-50 PFD and the energy relief that the House voted in a couple months ago. So I want to make that very clear for Alaskans that are watching because um, sometimes it seems to get lost in some sort of shell game. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Representative Rasmussen. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Very briefly, I wanted to highlight the hold harmless was raised as a concern. Um, my office did reach out to our ledge finance director, Mr. Painter. The state of Alaska only has one mechanism to distribute money to Alaskans, and that is as a dividend. So regardless of what we call the payment, um, it is going to go out from one account. It is maybe shuffling money in some ways, but the vote that we're about to take is whether or not we support $650 going out to Alaskans, that money is held harmless and Alaskans will receive it at the exact same time that the permanent fund dividend hits their bank account. So voting no effectively says no to $650. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Kronk. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just want to put it on the record here that my vote today is going to be for every constituent in my district. It's going to be for every constituent in everybody's district this year. Uh, everybody's going to be hurting. I've seen the emails. I've seen the messages. I am going to be voting yes to put two, 650 extra dollars in everybody's hands. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Prox. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I. I, too, am not happy about this budget nor the way that it came about. Um, <coughs> poor performance on the legislature's part, I guess. But times are tough. People are in a dire position. Lots of people are in a dire position. So if we can do anything to help them this year, I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There is uh, nothing about this process and this budget that I particularly like. Um, we are at the 11th hour, literally at the 11th hour, and I have, I have no real good feeling that if we were to say no to this budget or say no to this um, uh, appropriation here and go into a special session or an extended session to redo this budget, that we would get a better product than what we have now. Madam Speaker, we've taken care of ourselves as the government. 
we're fully funding all of government operations. We've taken care of a whole lot of special interests and, and uh, folks throughout the community who have wanted uh, capital spending. What we have done is paid for it in part by a tax on the uh, lowest income of the state by not paying a permanent fund dividend that's a statutory dividend. The best that I can do to hold my um, campaign promises and why I came down here is to spend out of the CBR because that's how somebody else structured the budget. I asked to put money in the budget and it was shot down in house finance. I don't, I don't have a choice other than to say no and then go nowhere because we're not going to get anything better if we go into a special session. It's the, it's the uh, pick from two bad choices. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I hope that we can do better next year. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Wall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to um, remind the body and people listening of a couple things. A lot of talk about a statutory PFD that goes by a formula devised in 1980 or 82. Um, I just want to remind people that it's, it's computed based on earnings every year and, and a 21% average over the last five years. Uh, that would include this year, and this year the permanent fund lost a lot of money. This year, fiscal year hasn't ended yet. We have about another month or so. So based on losses, the, the statutory PFD is not the number that we've been banting around. It would be less. And how much, I can't tell you because it depends how much are realized losses versus losses on paper. But it would be less. It wouldn't be the $4,200 that we're talking about. It, it could be significantly less. Uh, a couple other things. This permanent fund, uh, the checks that are going out in PFD, energy, whatever you want to call it, uh, the amount without the CBR amount of $650. It would be the largest amount ever paid out to Alaskans in total. There was in 2008, as many recall, a PFD check and then a supplemental energy check. Governor Palin paid out 2008. Those two amounts combined in the total appropriation, not necessarily the individual checks because there was less people living in the state, the total appropriation back then was $2.02 billion. This appropriation is $2.1 billion. It is larger. This is the largest amount in individual checks going out to Alaskans. And I think that's something that's good. And Alaskans do need it, and I do agree. However, I want to point out in that year of 2008, the state brought in $10 billion in oil revenue. Last year, in 2021, we brought in $1.2 billion, and in 2022, $3.5 billion. Our oil projections of what we're going to earn for this next year were based on three days in March, Department of Revenue, three days in March of the very highest oil prices. If you took that over 30 days in March and calculated that out, it could be less by a billion dollars. Oil prices, we don't know what they're going to do. I'm running out of time. I get it. Stock market took the biggest loss in two years today. Our finances aren't as secure as we think they are. We need to put some money away for savings. I think paying out the amount without the CBR is still great. It's the highest amount we've ever paid. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Spanholz. I just want to make a, a brief point of order. In um, Mason's Section 101, debate is limited to the question before the House. And the question before the House is, shall we approve the Constitutional Budget Reserve draw to pay for the energy relief payment that was uh, that is included in the budget? Thank you. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I will be a yes vote on this this evening. Uh, but I did I did want to highlight very quickly. I'm I'm very glad to hear. Um, a lot of rhetoric uh, from most folks in the in the body today talking about Alaskans who are hurting and that we need to make sure that we're um, ensuring that uh, they have access to the resources they need as we emerge from this pandemic and economic downturn. And and that's a that's a bit of a shift in the argument. I'm really glad to hear it. And in that case, um, I look forward to future efforts in that same vein on around living wage and pay transparency and affordable child care and unemployment insurance and affordable education, affordable health care. The list goes on and on. If we're worried about um, the welfare and survival of Alaskans, this is part of it that I'm happy to support. And I look forward to continuing to work towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none. 
Are you ready for the question? The question is, shall the appropriation for a portion of the energy relief check be paid by the Constitutional Budget Reserve? Members may proceed to vote. Will the clerk please lock the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? Will the clerk please announce the vote? 29 yeas, 11 nays. With 29 yeas and 11 nays, the appropriation has failed to pass the House. Brief it is. Will the House please come to order? The House will stand at recess to the call of the chair. Okay, is everybody just as confused as I am here? Didn't they just vote to yes to pass that with a vote of 35 to 11 nays and she just said the vote failed? I am really confused by what just happened there. I mean, I'm, I'm literally floored by that. Uh, anybody know what is going on over in the Senate? And, oh, they're still working on, it looks like, that same bill for SB 349, Amendment Number 2. So, I'm gathering by the vote that I just saw there, though, that, that, that the CBR just passed inside of the uh, Senate, or in, inside of the House there. So that would have been the other half of our stimulus check, and then she declares there that no, it failed. Uh, again, um, I'm a little confused by that very last vote and her statements at the end, because I'm looking at the vote. And this is Constitutional Budget Reserve Appropriation. It was 29 yeas to 11 nays, and she declared it failed. Uh, you figure it out. I have no idea. Uh, but I know the rest of you, as well as I am, is looking forward to seeing what is going on over at the Senate. So I am literally going to go ahead and swap over to the Senate. We don't need to see what they say about the a mental health budget that has been a unanimous vote since day one pretty much from both the Senate and the House they don't even have amendments for it they just rubber stamp that budget so let's pop over to the Senate because they still need to do exactly what just happened here over there and but I know they're working on another bill based on what I just saw a second ago so we are on to the Senate here. It should pop up in just a second there. Give it a moment. And all right, we are back and they are live on the Senate floor. I am gonna go ahead and activate their microphone and get myself off of the screen and we can get caught up in current on hopefully what bill they're working on right now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I move um, amendment number four. <laughs> got about a half an hour here. Seeing no further objection, amendment number four is adopted. Brief at ease. All right, that didn't take long for the Senate to already be go at ease there. Uh, but again, I, 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 hopefully you're just as floored as I am what just happened there inside of the house that was all, uh, what I would classify as a dang near unanimous vote to spend that $9 billion in pork. Oh, back at it, not at ease. <laughs> Is there any further amendments? 
I have no further amendments. Senator Holland. Thank you, Mr. President. It's an honor to carry House Bill 349 for a member of the other body from House District 9. Um, House Bill 349 was written because the way we search for oil and produce oil in the 21st century has changed drastically since the 50s. During those early years, policymakers were worried about oil companies drilling too many vertical wells spaced too tightly together, resulting in oil left in the ground that could no longer be recovered. The days of drilling cheap wells are truly over. No one is spending millions of dollars to drill unnecessary wells in Alaska today. In the decades since the early days of the industry, advancements in drilling technology allows wells to be directionally drilled underground, sometimes with multiple lateral wells from a single motherboard or parent well. Holes can be only a few thousand deep, yet tens of thousands of feet long to recover greater amounts of oil and gas. Unfortunately, our outdated statutes have not kept up with the advancements in the oil and gas industry. The statutes being amended by this legislation were originally designed to provide oversight by involving another step to provide assurance that perforations into the ground were not going to be too close, jeopardizing substructure integrity of the field or zone. This extra oversight is no longer necessary, slows down development, and costs the state time and money. House Bill 349 has broad support and eliminates needless regulatory red tape as drilling and production processes have fundamentally changed since the statutes were written. And uh, this uh, bill, along with the added amendments, uh, I urge your support. Thank you, Senator Holland. Additional comments on HB 349? Senator Reinbold. I move and ask unanimous to not be able to vote on this bill because one of my family members may benefit with that uh, cabin issue. Objection. There's objection. You'll be forced to vote. Thank you, Senator Reinbold. Any wrap up, Senator Holland? Green button. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the question. Shall the Senate pass HB 349? Senators may proceed to vote. Any senator failed to vote? Secretary will lock the roll. Do any senators wish to change their vote? Secretary will record and tally the vote. 19 yeas, zero nays. And so on a vote of 19 yeas and zero nays, HB 349 has passed the Senate. Sir, Madam, Madam Majority Leader, effective date. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call vote on the passage of the bill be considered the roll call vote on the effective date clauses. <laughs> Seeing no objection, the effective date clauses have been adopted. Brief at ease. Okay, you guys, uh, I just posted a, a comment onto, onto Facebook's page, and uh, I'm because I'm a little confused here. I thought they needed a two thirds vote to pass the budget inside uh, for the CBR, and two thirds of 40 comes out to be about 27 people, and they had a vote of 29. So uh, it's correct me if I'm wrong, but they only needed 27 votes to pass that. So to declare that it failed uh, is, is really confusing to me, and that that's kind of threw up a red flag. So I, I quickly did, you know, my calculator and said, "All right, uh, that should be a six 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 six, and let's multiply that times." Uh, 40 and see what it comes out to be and sure enough when I did the decimal point six 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 and Multiplied that by 40. I came out just a hair under 27 So they needed 27 votes and they got 29. So am I wrong? Uh, Three-quarters of a vote. So they needed 75% of them Not 66.666 Okay, so they needed a super, super majority. Um, I, I wasn't aware of that because I've seen it pass with less in the past, so that's why I'm a little confused. Um, it's not like the majority vote, which they only need plus one, uh, 11 in the Senate, 21 in the House, uh, if, if they have a full body sitting there. Um, 
Oh man, okay, so it is three quarters of a vote, then uh, so at least that's what the consensus is coming up on uh, all the different channels. Uh, thank you guys out there for, for posting that. Um, that that's quite sad uh, then, so we, we lost out on the, Pia, uh, the uh, extra $650 there. Uh, because there was uh, the, the, they were overwhelmingly voted for the other, but didn't for this. That Senate concurrent resolution 29 be brought up at this time. This is the title change amendment for HB 349. Okay. That brings us to the question, shall SCR 29 pass the Senate? Senators may proceed to vote. Does any senator fail to vote? Secretary will lock the roll. Do any senators wish to change their vote? <laughs> Secretary will record and tally the vote. 19 yeas, zero nays. And so on a vote of 19 yeas and zero nays, SCR 29 has passed the Senate. Brief at ease. So the, the Senate is doing pretty much like the House just got done doing. They're milking the hearing the actual budget down to the very last wire, down to the very last minute. And uh, this is intentional. Uh, I know after witnessing what we just saw in the House that nobody in the Senate is going to stand up to speak against this budget. It, it lines the pockets of the special interests out there with so much money that they're going to be floating in it. If it, if it was the us average people, we would be set for life. And uh, for these big corporations, the upper echelons are going to be set for life after this. And the peons down below them are going to be working, uh, collecting all of that money in, the, in the, their wages down below them. But, uh, you know, we're, we're talking hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that is being flown, flowing out of Juno here this year. $19 billion is what they have available to them when you include all the federal money, the infrastructure package money and all of that that it was giving to them to spend. And uh, if you combine what they had also added into it for next year's budget, that's another $9 billion on top of that, $29 billion in total. Oh, they are back again that we roll back up the calendar to messages from the House. We are messages of the House. Madam Secretary. Received message dated May 18 stating the House failed to recede from its amendments to Senate Bill Number 131 title amended, namely House CS for Senate Bill Number 131 finance, workers comp, disability for firefighters. The Speaker appointed the following members to a conference committee to meet with the Light Committee from the Senate to consider the bills. Representative Josephson, Chair, Representative Wool, Representative Carpenter. At this time, I'm appointing Senator Holland, Chair, Senator Meyer, and Senator Kawasaki to a conference committee on Senate Bill 131. Madam Majority Leader, there's a bill on the table. Are the Move and ask unanimous consent that we take um, HB 157 off the table. Seeing no objection, H, H, there's objection. <coughs> brief at ease. Okay, I think here in the Senate they're getting ready to actually hear the uh, budget bill. Um, they're break taking HB 157 uh, the, the Senator Hughes just asked them to table it temporarily so that they can do something else or just table the bill uh, that's exactly what the house did when they went to here bring up HB 281 um, just so you're all aware if you were not here for the actual vote 
they did pass a 2550 PFD. Uh, it was uh, the, the biggest vote that I have seen for a budget that wasn't passed uh, since uh, at least for the biggest we've ever seen in history just got passed. And then the CBR vote failed, so we lose 650 of our rebate check. Brief at ease. So we got the uh, $2,550 and $650 rebate check is what we are going to receive this year. So $3,200 basically is, is what is going to be given to each and every Alaskan, not the $3,800 and that $50 that we were promised um, that came out of the budget committee. And that's all because it failed to pass the CBR vote, which is why they had split the rebate check to try to convince more of the majority in the House to actually vote for it. And uh, they didn't do it. So all I can say is there's not a single legislator that is sitting there in Juneau right now in the House or the Senate that in either department that, in my opinion, anymore even deserves to be voted in this coming election. And uh, it'll be very telling with the vote that is about ready to happen. The Senate, I have a lot more respect for, for the fact that they did pass the, 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 the almost a statutory PFD. From the table. That brings us back to a set brief at ease. Okay, come on guys, get your acts back together. They had a whole bunch of legislators that decided to leave the room. Um, proceed to vote. back in. Brief at ease, void the roll. I told you you had a bunch of legislators that left the room. Can't you see all those empty chairs? Um, and you just forced a vote there when nobody was there. Come on now. I mean, gee whiz, even, I'm not even in the room and I can see that. And I'm tired. I've been going since 6 a.m. Oh, now, now somebody's, uh, why, why is Baggage walking out the door with uh, uh, McChicken's gavel there for? Can, can someone explain what we just witnessed? Uh, yeah, uh, that was quite comical to watch that just happen, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of figuring this one out here. <laughs> Literally, uh, Tom Baggage just grabbed the gavel out of uh, McChicken's hand and went walking out of the room there, and uh, that, that was quite interesting. <laughs> All right, guys, let's let's get things rolling here. I'm still quite disgusted by what happened over there in the house. So we only get half of a rebate check and uh, a bunch of the spending that was supposed to happen here in the Matsu Valley for infrastructures didn't happen because they didn't get the money that they needed for that. And uh, now we're, we're going to see what's going to happen here in the Senate. Even if the Senate does pass the budget and the CBR vote, we still won't get the other half of the energy check because the well, Senate, Senate didn't, uh, because the House didn't pass it on their end. Oh, taking oh, I thought they were back there. They, they put, oh, they are back. Table. Senators may proceed to vote. 
any senator failed to vote, the secretary will lock the roll. To any senators wish to change their vote, the secretary will record and tally the vote. Eight yeas, 11 nays. So on a vote of eight yeas and 11 yeas, nays, HB 157 will remain on the table. Brief at ease. At ease, not at ease, at ease, not at ease. Boy, this Senate's just as bad as the House. Actually, I think they're worse because I've been watching them for a while. They go at ease every opportunity they seem to get tonight. And it's just dragging on the process. The, this is all intentional. They have not brought up the House bills, uh, the, the budget bills at all. They, they did exactly what the House was doing before. They're waiting for the very last minute. They're not going to let any legislator have any time to talk that wants to talk. Kind of like they limited the only two people that got up in the House and spoke against that bloated, oversized budget. And the only two people that consistently voted no when it came time also happens to ironically be the same two people that uh, guaranteed we didn't see at least a 2020 vote in the House here just a few days ago so it's a lot of political shenanigans going on behind the scenes the blackmail the coercion the thinly veiled threats they have been being applied here inside of the Senate on a daily basis Bert Stedman and Natasha von Imhoff and uh, click Bishop and the, their little click in there have been going from door to door telling them exactly what they're gonna do and how they're gonna vote they tell you that they don't have an illegal binding caucus in the Senate or a binding caucus in the Senate. They are a caucus of equals, as they put it. But if you look at how things are voted um, and when it comes down to certain items, it doesn't follow along a caucus of equals. It's more like you, we own you, we own your vote. You vote the way we want you to vote because we won't give you the little perks that you're going to we're going to give you the promise is the blackmail to vote the way we want to if you don't um, and uh, it, you can see it very much on display in the house compared to the senate it is much worse in the house there is a guaranteed illegal binding caucus going on there their votes are compromised their legislators no longer represent the uh constituents that voted them into office they are 100 percent bought and owned by the unions the school teachers the the works and you can hear that when they are talking and declaring what they want to declare and uh, uh oh mchicken left and hughes is taking the seat Oh my gosh, McChicken fled the coop and put Senator Hughes in charge. I, I am a little bit floored about what just is going on there inside of the Senate. Uh, what shenanigans are going on uh, in that room now? Uh, so, okay, we're putting the hens in charge of the, the hen house and the rooster has left the room. Um, or the chicken, I should say. And uh, so it's really kind of uh, confusing what is going on. There goes the gavel. Thank you, Madam President. I move that we uh, move down the calendar to special orders. Hearing no objections, we're under special orders. I uh, move and ask the honor of the floor on the subject of um, the 10th decade of faith, love, and life of Madeline Marie Machicki. Madeline Marie Machicki, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madeline Machicki, best known as Marie, grew up in a nine-child household in a small apartment, apartment in Brooklyn, New York. She was born in 1931. There's a very good reason that generation was known as the greatest generation. They demonstrated tenacity, fortitude, unity, and very little whining, Madam President. We all passed a citation in her honor the other day, and, and 
She's read an amazing life. She grew up in a very low-income household, but they didn't know that they were poor. Their active life and household were always filled with dozens of visiting relatives, plenty of delicious food, mostly homemade pasta, and an endless supply of love. At 13, already an excelling student, she realized she wanted more than the local public school. She wanted to be a dressmaker, designer, and she convinced her father to allow her to go to school in Manhattan. Now think about that. She went to an all-girls school called Washington Irving High School in Manhattan. During the 40s, it was unthinkable for a young girl to get on the subway and travel alone to the big city. Yet her father, who was a tailor, agreed, and when he could get away from his job in Manhattan, he would stop by and check in on her, make sure everything was okay. She excelled in all of her classes, became the co-valedictorian, and in instead of pursuing a career in fashion, she uh, began giving the time of day to a young man named Pete from her neighborhood. At the age of 21, she married um, Peter Frank Machicki, my father, and the love of her life. Their marriage began Marie's greatest accomplishment, a healthy, happy household. She devoted her entire life to raising her four children and her family. She was known as the world's greatest mother, and I say that because the world's greatest mother statue, remember those little plastic statues when we were kids? It's still on her kitchen table 50 years later. She's the world's greatest mother. Much of her life, she spent her time loving her family, reading to her kids, volunteering in schools, church, attending sports activities, and even serving as my Cub Scout leader. Because of her dedication to her family, this stay-at-home mom was rarely home at all due to her selflessness except to prepare delicious nightly homemade meals for her family. And when finances got tight and we got a little older, she went to work. She began at Sears Roebuck and pro progressed into a full-time career at Bell South as a controller until her retirement. Most of all, Marie stands out for total devotion and love for her family and her sense of compassion and kindness for everyone, especially those in need. She's a true woman of strength, fueled by her unwavering faith. When times are tough, she always finds comfort through her faith and prayer. Since the early 80s, uh, she split her time between her children in Florida and her grandchildren, and um, her children and grandchildren in Alaska. Even now that she has entered her 10th decade of life, she remains active, relevant, adventurous, sharp as a tack, and the family Scrabble champion. Um, she's still adventurous. And, and I remember a trip just two summers ago, we went to Hesketh Island, and uh, we were loading her from the bigger boat into a Zodiac, a couple of buddies were helping me put her in the boat, and one of my friends, um, Cam, said, well, let's be careful not to drop her. And I said, drop her? That's not an option. <laughs> anyway, um, just wanted to honor the life of an amazing woman. The life so far, Madeline Marie Machicki. You know, Madam President, we all have our moral compass in life, most hopefully pointing in the right direction. My compass was programmed through the love, faith, kindness, and intellect of my mother, Madeline. So now that you're in your 10th decade, thank you, Mom, for that bright light you continue to bring to this world. You, in fact, bring the greatest generation values to all you meet every day. I love you, Mom. Adios. Adios. Oh, wasn't that adorable? Such a great speech by McChicken there. Great eat up of time to delay things even further so we can actually get on with the uh, next section of this at the moment in time. It's like, come on, let's. We, we would love to all hear your votes, and we, we hopefully you, you might grandstand and. Tell us a little bit more. Here we go. Madam Secretary. 
The Finance Committee considered House Bill Number 306 extend Board of Pharmacy and recommended it be replaced with a Finance Senate Committee substitute. New title with SCR 31. Previous fiscal note, signing due pass, Senators Stedman, Bishop, co-chairs, Senators Hoffman, Willikowski, Olson, Von Emhoff. Signing no recommendations, Senator Wilson. The bill has no further referral. The bill is in the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee has placed the bill on today's calendar. Senate CS for CS Pardon, Senate CS for House Bill Number 306, House Bill Number 306 by Representatives Story Josephson, an act extending the termination date of the Board of Pharmacy and providing for an effective date. The Finance Committee considered the bill and recommended it be replaced with a Finance Senate Committee substitute. New title with SCR 31. Previous fiscal note signing due pass. Senators Stedman, Bishop, co chairs, Senators Hoffman, Willikowski, Olson, Von Imhoff. Signing no recommendation. Senator Wilson, there is a Finance Senate Committee substitute. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. President. I move and ask unanimous consent that the Senate Finance Committee substitute for House Bill 306 be adopted in lieu of the original bill. Mr. Minority Leader, um, do you object for... Object for, for purposes of a description of changes, Mr. President. I, I had a feeling you might. Mr. Um, Senator Bishop. I thought we was going to get away with one there for a minute. The committee substitute for House Bill 306 finance makes the following changes, and hopefully the last one. It adds a section extending the sunset date for the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board, June 30, 2027. 20, that's, yes. Mr. President, that's the only change? I objected for that. <laughs> I, I withdraw my objection. Seeing no further objection, we have adopted the Finance Committee substitute for HB 306. Um, I, have, I have no amendments. Okay. Um, Madam Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the bill be engrossed, advanced to third reading, and placed on final passage. Seeing no objection, we were in third. Senator Reinbold. Um, I will be voting for this, but once again, I think it's super important to honor a relationship. I really want the board to hear this. I was going to do amendment. I decided not to, uh, to just to honor the patient health care worker and uh, don't try to inhibit really important if, um, uh, medicines such as ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. With that, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reinbold. Madam Secretary, will you read the bill for the third and final time? Senate CS for House Bill Number 306 Finance, an act extending the termination dates of the Board of Pharmacy and the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board and providing for an effective date. I have no idea who's carrying this bill. Senator Keel. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my honor to carry House Bill 306. Between the Senate Secretary and the description of changes, I think we all know what it does. I recommend a yes vote. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Keel. Further discussion on HB 306. Seeing none, any wrap-up, Senator Keel? <laughs> oh, that brings us to the question. Shall HB 306 pass the Senate? Senators may proceed to vote. Does any senator fail to vote? Secretary will lock the roll. Do any senators wish to change their vote? Secretary will record and tally the vote. 19 yeas, 0 nays. And so on a vote of 19 yeas and 0 nays, HB 306 has passed the Senate. Madam Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call vote on the passage of the bill be considered the roll call vote on the effective date clauses. Seeing no objection, the roll call, um, I'm sorry, the effective date clauses have been adopted. Brief at ease. Okay, guys, you are running out of time. You have 27 minutes left to get your butts in gear and get those votes finalized. And uh, so, yeah, I am waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Come on, we are waiting. Oh, there goes the gavel again. Come back to order. Senator Hughes. I'm sorry, Madam Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that Senate Concurrent Resolution 31 be brought up at this time. This is the title change amendment for House Bill 306. Shall SCR 31 pass the Senate? Senators may proceed to vote. If any senator failed to vote, Secretary will lock the roll. Do any senators wish to change their vote? 
Secretary will record and tally the vote. 19 yeas, zero nays. So on a vote of 19 yeas and zero nays, SCR 31 has passed the Senate. Brief at ease. All right, we are literally beginning to run out of time here on their end. Uh, it makes me wonder what their next steps are going to be. The clock is ticking out, and they've got 26 minutes left until midnight, and everything has to be completed and done and gaveled out for the very last time. And they all say their farewells to Juno, or... They go into a special session, and uh, you know, and personally, you know, I would not have no heartache over them going into a special session at this point and bringing the bills to where they have to actually uh, work on the budget and they have to enforce all legislators to work on it. I know if I was the governor and they forced themselves into a special session, I would be dictating that uh, the state and capital budget and the mental health and the supplemental uh everything that they are voting on here tonight that all 40 inside of the house and all 20 inside of the senate need to sit down inside of the room just like they are here right now and go through all 200 pages of that line by line up and down vote by hand why to give it or why not to give it and those in the commit finance committees who say they know everything and they know what's best should be able to answer it and uh, they should also have their special experts like painter and uh, the ones that they always bring in for their committees to help them out so that they can do it be able to do what they need to do while they're there to get all of the relevant information that they need to have and uh, hopefully you guys are all as awake as I am right now um, I wish I would have had another cup or two of coffee before this day had begun I am now officially been up pretty much uh, we're, we're just a few hours shy of being to 24 hours it feels like I, I got about six more hours to go before but uh, an 18-hour day so far and still going strong. So the House has passed their budget and uh, it did not pass the CBR vote, which is where the committee had put the second half of our stimulus check into. So we're only going to see $650 instead of $1,300. The permanent fund dividend, uh, as far as I am still aware, but they I swear it's not that way that we've lost even more in the CBR, but they swear that the entire PFD was a part of the general funds budget, so that that twenty-five fifty is still going to uh, to each and every one of us. If we are to believe what they said, that that is a fifty percent of what our PFD is supposed to be, that means our PFD should have been fifty-one hundred dollars if they were following the statutory PFD law. We had legislators get up onto the floor in the House and declare that uh, if they were to have followed the statutory formula, it would have been nowhere even close to that $4,200 that the Senate had passed. Oh, no, nowhere close to that. <coughs> Excuse me, they're, they're right. Because if we follow what they were saying prior to that, that this is 50% of what a statutory PFD would have been, then obviously that our PFDs would have been much more, not $4,200, but $5,100. Facts matter. Words matter. Our mainstream media and legislators in there in Juno, both in the House and the Senate, have called the refund check and our PFD all as a PFD. You are getting a $3,800 PFD. Shut your mouths and be happy with that. 
oh now wait a minute yeah thirty eight hundred dollars no 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 that's not happening anymore we're gonna decide it that uh, six hundred and fifty dollars of that no longer belongs to you because they didn't get the three quarters vote to, to take the rest of the money that the subcommittee there had shifted over into the CBR vote that other half of our stimulus check originally in both the House and the Senate was located in the general funds budget. It's needed a simple majority vote to have passed that and we would have saw all of the money. But nope, those six in the subcommittee, that uh, joint committee there, they did their normal manipulation, back mail, back door, uh, thinly veiled threat politics that they are extremely good at doing and they moved that money's funding to come out of the CBR, which they needed, no, they needed three quarters vote to get. And they thought the fact that uh, them putting it in there would convince enough of those Republicans, the, the, the very minority few that are sitting inside of the House, would vote for that. And uh, it kind of it, it didn't really surprise me that it did not pass. I was under the assumption, though, that they, they only needed a uh, two-thirds vote, not a three-quarters vote. So that's a little bit different than in most places. Uh, so you need a three-quarters vote to tap into the money that's in the CBR account. And uh, because they only got 29 of the legislators to vote yay, it was just shy of what they needed to be able to tap into that money and uh, give us the other half of the stimulus re rebate check. Well, mind you, that also prevented them from putting a lot of pork into special interests' pockets, but it left it sitting in places that the legislators need a simple minority to spend that money in the future. And it really was not a lot of money. I mean, pretty much they called it our rebate check vote when it came time for the CBR vote. This is the rebate check vote. So time for you guys to stand up and vote for your rebate or not. If you vote no, no rebate. If you vote yes, rebate. Ignore the, I believe it was $500 million to go to the University of Alaska for the loan program that got swept up. They were putting it back into their own special privy little account. Uh, the, the one that they've been trying to turn into a designated fund here recently. So what is happening in the Senate? Um, uh, anybody in the comments, uh, I, I haven't seen anybody say that there has been an actual vote in the Senate at all yeah, for the Senate budget. Um, have any of you seen them declare anything for a vote in the Senate for uh, HB 281, the, the state and capital budget? I haven't seen anything at all myself, and I'm still looking. Um, let me know if, if you have seen anything, but as far as I know, they have not voted on that. I have been watching it uh, pretty much all afternoon, and what I could get when I got back into internet uh, cell phone uh, range earlier today, uh, the, all I can say is going north really does suck for internet, uh, especially if you have like GCI. Uh, you lose all internet once you get past Willow, and uh, then you even lose cell phone for quite a while in different areas. And I was at a place working that had neither, so I completely had no phone and I had no uh, internet, so I had no clue what was going on down there in Juneau. But I knew by looking at the schedule they had on for the beginning of the day, they were never going to get to the actual budget until late this evening. And this is all intentionally done on purpose. So we'll, we'll see what's going on there and how quickly it happens. And I don't see anybody putting anything into the comments there saying that they have voted about this. Uh, the only good thing that came out of the House was HB, or SB114. And uh, that was a... Oh, now I know I am getting really tired. It was the Reeds Act, and the Reeds Act itself uh, is a bill that Senator Shelley Hughes and um, a couple of others have been championed now for the last three plus years over in the Senate, working trying to get that through, and uh, that's the the Reed by Nine 
basically bill that uh, says that uh, by the third read by the third grade you should be able to read and a lot of opposition on that bill I that was when I started live streaming this was right when they were discussing that bill on the house floor and it was amazing listening to them argue the equity and diversity as they call it uh, just uh, those are colorful words for the critical race theory that they wish to be teaching and uh, this bill does a lot to help combat that uh, not necessarily so and in, in keeping that out of the curriculum but it forces a more traditional reading learning style so you can't just start bringing in all of these diverse unique ways of doing things you need to have a tried true we're going to get your child to be able to read by the time they're in the third grade nine years old approximately we're going to make that happen so okay so nobody has said anything about having anything in there for them voting in the senate for the budget so that means they're leaving this for the last 16 minutes here on the screen there is there is nothing else to say in that regards to that they got a vote on it tonight they have until midnight if they don't vote on the budget and then this goes into a special session because by law they have to be gaveled out by midnight tonight and so now we're in that hurry up and wait mode again um, I haven't seen anything saying that the Senate has voted, and I haven't seen anybody that's been watching tonight saying that the Senate has voted. And we all watched what happened in the House. I've also posted up the uh, pictures from their votes, both on the uh, adoption of HB 281, the state capital budget there, and uh, the second vote for um, the CBR vote, which failed. And uh, so those are both posted already on Facebook right now at this moment in time. And so was the Reads Act one from earlier today. And now we're, and so I'm still patiently sitting here, and I'm sure all of you are too, waiting for HB 281 and uh, the CBR vote to come up on the floor here. And they have literally 14 minutes. And the only reason why I would, if I was in their position and had only 14 minutes left, this is going to be an up or down vote. They're going to put it onto the floor. They're not. Nobody's going to speak to it other than here's the, the quick synapses of the changes. And, and they're going to throw up the vote. And then they're going to be up and down and move directly on to the CBR vote and not even have no discussions in there. They might have one or two people that might actually put their foot down I, w I would be really remiss if I didn't see Senator Shower standing up on both of those and saying something. But after seeing the cowards in the House uh, not even stand up and speak to it, and the only two that did are the ones that sunk it when it came time for current concurrence of the whole House to the original Senate bill, those were the only two people that got up and spoke inside of the House against passage of those bills. And everybody else in the room was silent, quiet, crickets. I mean, you could have been playing, uh, the, standing in the forest, expecting to hear that tree fall that was halfway across the world. And that's kind of the way it felt inside of that room. If you, if you just totally make your stomach drop. So we're still sitting here waiting for them to actually do something. I am really shocked to see Senator Natasha Von Imhoff there. Uh, not really. It's the, the it's crunch time. It's time to put the money into her family's pocketbook. So she is not going to miss a vote that puts money into her family's pocketbooks if it means she's not there. So that that's a guarantee. But you can see how nonchalant and relaxed everybody is in the room and they know midnight's almost here and we're still all sitting waiting for them to actually do something <clears throat> man mm, dry throat there going on it's a combination of being overly tired because two nights ago I only got about three hours of sleep because I had an emergency call out at four o'clock in the morning and just gone to bed at midnight 
and then no more than got back into the door here at the house and turned around and had to repack back up and go back out to work again and then I was going very strong and solid all day yesterday made it in long enough to live stream what was going on yesterday afternoon and then was right back out the door again in the the evening redoing more work and then I was up again at six o'clock this morning and I've been going strong all day made it home at six o'clock started this and I haven't stopped this since it started only breaks I've taken was long enough to make a plate of something to munch on while I was doing this and get my nightly chores of hauling into firewood for the fireplace so that I can actually keep the place kind of comfortable still because we're still hovering quite a little we're a little bit closer to freezing temperatures than I would like at this time of the year we just finally started breaking above the freezing temperatures over the last past week in the evening hours so to actually wake up and see that it still said 36 on the thermometer this morning was nice instead of seeing the normal 31 32 that I've been seeing for many 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 weeks and months now on end so again we're still sitting here waiting for them and let me see any good comments here showers for the people Okay, I'm sure everybody there is reading the comments right along. I think I've addressed most of them, and you're just uh, kind of commenting back on the same thing that I've been saying here uh, in concurrence. And So, McChicken, come on, let's gavel in. Um, we got 10 minutes left by the clock that's there on the screen on the floor. So that means they need to get this done. And again, I haven't heard that they've had the vote for this, so... Unless you guys all know something different, I even looked at the, the I've looked at Gavel a couple of times today, trying to find anything that said they had a vote on this, and I don't find anything. But the House sure has, and uh, decimating by what uh, the overwhelming vote that they had on the first part of the budget that just needed a simple majority. They got the super majority. They they got the vote they needed for the CBR, spending all the money on the pork to the special interest. And then when it came to giving another portion to us Alaskans, then they don't get the vote. So take note in that, that those that voted no on the CBR, but they voted yes for HB 281, that first part of the vote, no matter what the how they voted on the second one, if they voted yes on that first part of that budget, they are just as corrupt as every single person that voted no on the second part. And I mean no as in they changed their votes. They were yes now, but now they're no. Wait a minute. So they're, you're yes to spend the pork on the special interest unions healthcare, education, nonprofits, for-profits, unions, I think I said them once already, uh, the Ransomson Foundation, Natasha Von Imphoff's pockets, Kelly Merrick's uh, husband's pockets. I mean, I could keep going down the list of the special interests that these people work for, and they're not a single person I'll list off there uh, represents the majority of Alaskans, just their minority little clique. That benefits of hundreds of millions and hundreds of thousands, depending on what level they are in the game, and from our state, local, and federal taxes every single year. It looks like they're finally going to get back in session here. I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. I'll get myself off the screen and get ready for that gavel to come down again. And uh, they have eight minutes left to finish up the state's business before legally by law, state law, they got to be gaveled out for the year. So the hurry up and wait. And uh, I know I am ready for this to get done, did over with. I'm tired. Um, I, I'm going to be back up bright and early again tomorrow morning. I, I will probably get about five hours of sleep tonight. 
and uh, then I'm going to have to be back up. In fact, as I was just talking here a couple minutes ago, I received a text on the phone. Another customer is giving me that late midnight hour uh, message saying, uh, we're desperately in need of your help. How early can you get here? Sorry to bother you so late. Uh, it's that time of the year for me. It, it always seems to crop up and happen and uh, never seems to cease or end. And all right, guys, I'm waiting for that at ease to get off of the screen there. So I'll pop myself back up here real quick. I, I would have swore by every way everybody was moving into the room that they were going to finally cavil in and finish up the state's business. They got six minutes to do that within. Um, may, maybe they need to have baggage go grab the uh, McChicken's gavel again and go swinging around in a circle to get people back in the room to finish this up. Because I'd love to see what happens if they don't. Order, there they go. Leader. Mr. Patterson, I move and ask unanimous consent that we roll up to reports of standing committees. <laughs> Madam Secretary. Conference committee report dated May 18, stating the conference committee considering Senate Bill Number 131 title amended and House CS for Senate Bill Number 131 finance recommends conference committee substitute for House Bill Number 131 be adopted, signing the report, Senator Holland, Chair, Senators Kawasaki, Myers, Representative Josephson, Chair, Representatives Wool, Carpenter. Okay. That brings us to the question, shall the Senate adopt the conference committee report? Senate may proceed to vote. So every senator voted. Secretary will lock the roll. If senators wish to change their vote, secretary will record and tally the vote. 19 yeas, zero nays. On a vote of 19 yeas and zero nays, the Senate has adopted the conference committee report on Senate Bill 131. Madam Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call vote on the passage of the bill be considered the roll call vote on the effective date clauses. Seeing no objection, the roll call date uh, the effective date clauses have been adopted. Brief at ease. Oh, come on now. Um, I, I know you guys, I'm sure them down there want to leave out of this room just as badly as those watching here want to go to bed. Uh, I, I don't know very many night owls that uh, work for a living. Um, they're, they're far and few in between in my circles anymore. In my younger days, I knew a lot of them. I don't know very many of them now. And uh, so, yeah, this being up this late, uh, where the, most of the folks I work with are already waking up by 4 o'clock in the morning heading to their job, where <laughs> the, this is kind of, you know, really late for me. And uh, But, no, I, I, I accept the pain and the pleasure of doing this for all of you. I love exposing the corruption that is going on the, the, when I first got into doing this about six years ago. And I began learning all of the stuff that happens and started getting good at understanding it. And then I started reporting on it. And uh, then I started exposing it. And the more I kept exposing out there, the, it got to the point to where here over the last couple of years, uh, none of the parties in Alaska really want to associate with me anymore because they're too afraid that I'm going to find out something about them and let everybody else in the world know about it. But in my opinion, that's what any good journalist does. They dig for the truth. They try to expose what people don't want into the public eye, and I got pretty good at that. Please come back to order. Senator Bishop. Yes, can we roll down the calendar special orders? Seeing no objection, we are under special orders. And I just ask a little leeway here just for a minute because I'm going to break protocol. I just want to... I'd, Move and ask unanimous consent. I want to recognize Senator Natasha Vanimov. Hearing no objection, Senator Bishop. This will be brief, but uh, thank you for improving all of our vocabulary. Uh, we learned a new word, turducken, 
And uh, thank you for making me a better reader of spreadsheets. We're going to miss your enthusiasm. You know, if you're going to outwork her, you better bring a lantern and a lunch sack, because that's how she attacks every day. And uh, I, we all want to wish you many blessings. And uh, thank you for your services, State of Alaska, and your sacrifices that you put up with. And we know what those are. And uh, thank you, and God bless you. Other special orders? Senator Keel. Thank you, Mr. President. Move and ask unanimous consent to thank my seatmate. To thank my seatmate. To thank your seatmate. Senator Keel. Mr. President, in similar vein, the member who sits next to me from part of the Anchorage Hillside uh, has become a friend of mine. He's a dedicated public servant with a record of sacrifice. I, I don't know what his future holds, um, but it won't be here sitting next to me, and that's a darn shame. I appreciate serving with him, even when he votes wrong. <laughs> Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move and ask unanimous consent for the special privilege of the floor to discuss us. Us, without objection, Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Your minority has tried very hard over the last few years to work with your majority. I think we've been very successful in that. Part of that is about relationships. I've talked about it a few times on this floor. I want to say it again, I couldn't be prouder than to work with you most of the time. And it's been enlightening for me to work with folks of different ideology, from different backgrounds, from different places in the state, from different parts of the country, and have all come together here, now, this time, to try to do the right thing, not just for all of us here, but for all the citizens of the state of Alaska. It is the highest privilege to serve with all of you. I'm gonna miss my colleagues that are leaving, and I just hope that everyone is moving to a place that is enjoyable and fun, and that we have a wonderful summer, and that we truly, truly, truly remember how well we've worked together over this last two years. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Begich. Other special orders? Seeing none, ah, Senator Holland. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, move and ask unanimous, unanimous consent to speak uh, for the special privilege of the floor to speak on end of days. On end of days, Senator Holland. So uh, I have my 121st day here, and I would give everyone out, but y'all all got these 121 days ago. I'm sure y'all have been keeping up like I have. And I just want to take a moment to say I appreciate the patience, uh, you know, Freshman legislators can be difficult to deal with. They're slow to learn. They, uh, they can be obnoxious at times. And I want to appreciate your patience and understanding for my colleague from the North Pole. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Other special orders? Before we go to the next person, uh, I want to thank you all for your sacrifice, dedication to the people of Alaska, and your friendship. Senator Stevens. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's been my pleasure to serve um, as your Senate Rules Chairman. I want to thank each of your offices for all your assistance in working to move bills through our body in the legislature. This year, 59 members of the legislature are up for election. So as we assemble here for our last floor session of the 32nd Alaska State Legislature, it will be up to the voters of Alaska as to the members that return. However, we are aware that Senator Von Emhoff has indicated that she is not returning, that's not standing for re-election, and will not be returning to the next Senate, uh, next leg legislature. I want to thank Senator Von Emhoff for her tireless service on behalf of our great state. She has served tirelessly, and she has done so with diligence and determination for all Alaskans, even when doing so required her to balance her Senate duties at times of great personal adversity. In recognition of her service, Mr. President, I ask that the Senate allow Senator Von Emhoff to make the motion for the Senate to adjourn sine die from the second regular session of the 32nd Alaska State Legislature. Thank you, Senator Stevens. 
Seeing no other special orders, Senator Von Emhoff. Thank you. I will miss this place. Uh, I move and ask unanimous consent to sine die the 32nd legislature. Seeing no objection, we will adjourn sine die from the 32nd legislature. Okay, you guys all heard it here first. They are done, uh, completed. They have gaveled out for the very last time down there in Juneau. And uh, so we will not see them again other than in their empty campaign promises running for elections this year, making all the same empty promises that they have made to us year after year after year. We promise you this time we won't do nothing wrong we promise you this time we will get it right and uh, so they must have had that vote for the the budget earlier and we missed it and uh, so i will have to go back and scour through to try to find it because i want to hear if they made any comments whatsoever i don't even find anything online showing their votes so i'm really curious when that got snuck into all of this but we heard what happened in the House. It's very saddening to know that Alaskans get screwed again in the special interest feast off of our famine. And uh, it was an intentionally done the way it was done. And this is politics in Alaska. Uh, thank you guys all for being here. Please like and share this video if you have not done so. Please do it now. And uh, and always please go to our website at politidict.com and click that support button. All proceeds go right into making sure we can be here to do these kind of broadcasts and pay for the restream services that allows this to be broadcasted on YouTube, Twitter, here at Facebook, and also on Facebook at Politidict Unfiltered and also on our website at politidict.com live. If you were to type that in, politidict.com backslash live, you will go directly to our page on our website and you would be able to watch any live broadcast that is happening. Otherwise, it's just a black screen sitting there waiting for the next live stream to occur. It is your support and your donations that has made that happen. So once again, please go to our website, show your support. If you love what we're doing, show us a lot of support. If you love a little bit of what we're doing, show a little bit of support. But every penny goes right back into what we're doing right now. And we're definitely going to need it for this up and coming summer season with having 59 of our 60 legislators running up for re-election this year, and plus governor for the state. And uh, we've got the CONCON, -Con, the Constitutional Convention, coming up. And I want to be out there live streaming as many of these protests and rallies and gubernatorial campaign um, forums and you name it. Anything that I can get involved in and stream it to get it out to as many Alaskans as I can. I want to be able to be there, but without your support, I'm not a very rich person. I do live very much hand to mouth, and my work keeps me just funded enough to be able to get me to my jobs and keep my family well fed and keep us warm. But uh, it does not give me a lot of extra money to go and try to do to, to cover the costs of this. And one of the last things we'd love to see to be able to start doing is start streaming this also to Rumble. We really do need to get it put onto a channel that we cannot be censored from. And Rumble is that platform. And with your support, we could actually make that happen. But unlike Restream, Restream is about $800 a year for just their services. To get on Rumble, that's their basic plan at $50 a month. And that only allows 50 people to watch any one broadcast at a time. And Rumble isn't censoring. So I know the minute that I start live streaming onto Rumble's platform, I will go far and beyond anything I ever see on any of the other channels right now because they have this, they have Politic Shadow Band. And uh, I don't even reach a tenth of my nearly 5,000 followers that I have just here on Facebook. So please like and share this video. Guys, all have a great evening, and I will see the, you all the next time.